I'll remember that for the future. But I did get one today, though. Yeah. I sent it to you. <laughs> I read it. Well, then you do. Oh, you don't answer. I don't answer. Them. Good to go, Christian? I'm not totally technically ignorant. Bruce looks like he's... Um, <laughs> Mr. Um, <coughs> okay. Joan, have you started the machine? The laptop's on. I haven't gotten it yet. Okay. Just start getting yourself ready. <laughs> Warm up the engine. <laughs> All right. We're ready to go, guys. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's June 6, 2012, approximately 7 p.m., and this is a regularly scheduled meeting of the school committee. We will begin with public participation. Is there anybody here who would like to address the committee? Seeing none, we'll move on to good news. Dr. Rabinovich. Oh, if I can find my, see if this thing works on it or for me. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, John. Um, well, I can probably talk for the majority of the staff that since um, there are, after today, only seven days left. The <laughs> students and the staff probably think that that is good news. There are a lot of field days, field trips, and other activities going on in this post-MCAS time of year. And, um, but I don't have any specific good news except for the fine job that the chair did this morning on the gumbo show. Thank you. Cliff, good news? No, it's, um, it's good news. It's kind of hard to find good news given the headlines of, of last week. But, uh, you know, I think that uh, we had a really, really unbelievable awards night, senior awards night. Um, we gave, uh, the community gave in excess of $220,000 in local scholarships. That certainly is good news. Uh, I, I took a h good hard look at some of the colleges uh, that our kids are going to, and despite our fiscal problems, uh, we're still placing kids in very, very good schools. Um, 80, I think it's 86 or 87 percent of our kids are going on to post-secondary education. So um, I think all of that um, uh, says volumes about the job that our teachers are doing under very, very trying conditions. So I just thought that that would be good news that I'd like to share. Rhonda? Just to congratulate the students from the Wareham Cooperative, as well as the Wareham High School for uh, graduating, and you know, only wishing them the best in uh, what their lives uh, have laid out for them. Yes, I concur. <coughs> uh, without diminishing any uh, prior speeches by our valedictorians and salutatorians, I thought the two that, uh, that uh, were there, this particular graduation did an outstanding job in uh, not only in being thoughtful, but at appropriate times being humorous. And I think that um, they did a, an extremely good job. Uh, I, I will say that I noticed that the s scholarships were down slightly from a year ago. A year ago is about 240,000. Not that 220 some odd thousand dollars isn't isn't fantastic, and it uh, it uh, makes other communities look look like paupers, which is fantastic. But the reason we're down is not because of a lack of commitment from from some people. What I was told was literally some some uh, major givers because of the financial situation in the stock market and interest rates and things like that these endowed scholarships had to be that much more conservative about the numbers of scholarships they were giving, but the actual commitment of these, of these organizations is still very high. So I think we should be very thankful and also very proud that they see uh, this community as a good place to invest. Um, okay, uh, minutes of the meeting of May 23rd. The movie accept as presented. Do I have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Three zero zero. Would it be appropriate to say at this particular time um, how, how thorough a job that our secretary does on these minutes? No. Um, I, 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 you know, sometimes she uh, 
and she goes unnoticed. But uh, this was particularly a, a tough meeting, and it was a long meeting, and and I think she should be complimented on the fine job that she did. I Thank agree. You. Uh, school committee reports. Do we have any reports from any of the members that are here tonight? We have a meeting scheduled for next week on Tuesday the 12th uh, for our first meeting for the technology and curriculum uh, advisory committee. Good. That's a rather important committee. W which day did you say it was going to be again? The 12th. The 12th. The 12th. The 12th. Okay. Who's on that committee? Um, you and uh, Mrs. Buchan are on that committee. Oh, really? Yes. I didn't know that. Um, we're having a meeting. I'm glad, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> yes, I am too. Um, there was a meeting of the <laughs> superintendent's budget uh, advisory committee. Um, both uh, Ken Fonts and I attended. Uh, it was it was a difficult, uncomfortable meeting because it was the final process by which we made all the cuts necessary to get to a balanced budget um, with the assumption that the override and debt exclusions uh, will not pass. It's a process we had to go through. Um, it had integrity. Uh, it made sense. Um, it had ramifications for um, significant ramifications for both the elementary schools and the high school, and um, I think we've talked about those ramifications significantly over the last several months, so I won't go into the details, but suffice it to say, almost two dozen teachers were, um, were given uh, their notice, and I sincerely hope that we will be in a position by the end of July to be able to rehire them, assuming they are still available, which is the key issue. Um, and the end of July is the key issue as well, because the longer we go uh, before we can offer them positions uh, back, uh, the less likely they are to be available for obvious reasons. Um, to remind everybody, um, Tuesday, uh, June 12th, uh, the Board of Selectmen will be holding a meeting. Um, the school committee is on the agenda. We expect to get started about 7.30, according to the chairman. Uh, it will be a posted meeting. Welcome, Mike. Uh, it will be a posted meeting of the school committee, so we hope all of our members can attend. Um, I will be making an opening statement. Dr. Rabinovich will be making a short presentation, and then we will be urging the uh, Board of Selectmen to deliberate and vote on the, uh, on the uh, creation of a special ballot and a special election as soon as possible. Um, if, if that all takes place, there is a mandated 35-day uh, period uh, after which the special election can take place. So that's why we're thinking, uh, best case, it's towards the end of July before we might be able to rehire, assuming the good citizens of, uh, of this town uh, see the wisdom in, in um, approving the override. The debt exclusions are obviously not, don't directly impact um, the hiring of teachers, but they have a significant impact on multiple areas of the school. Uh, technology. And the town. And the town, yes. Technology and textbooks, um, the uh, gymnasium roof, uh, the school buses, and of course the uh, feasibility study for, for a minor forest school, which would allow us to, uh, to continue along a track of um, renovating and uh, refurbishing and replacing many aspects of, the, of that school so that we can be as proud of, of Minor Forest as we are of this school and of course the high school which still looks really good after many years of service. So once again, that's uh, seven o'clock Tuesday, June 12th on the uh, top floor of the multi-service center. Uh, with that, I'll move on to the superintendent's report. Um, if I can could, just could I go back to that for a second? Sure. What is the location of that meeting? 
Uh, top floor of the multi-service center. It will be in their room? Yes. That is at the current time. However, if there are too many people that want to attend, they will have to move. Um, I have asked uh, Mr. Foster to explore um, also setting up the auditorium at Town Hall um, as a secondary location, but you know, we'll have to see how many people show up at that meeting. And I have, and I have offered um, Chairman Holmes the opportunity to, to meet with, uh, with him and with Dr. Rabinovich and, and Mr. Foster so that we could uh, make sure there aren't any surprises at that meeting, including the number of people who might attend. Um, uh, to date, that hasn't happened, but uh, we've been open and, and uh, forthcoming about the fact that we ex expect a lot of interest on the part of the town. Thank you, Mr. Chair. This is a follow-up, really, to Jeff's report. Um, yes, yesterday, Anna and I met with um, John Foster, the acting TA, and Derek, and went through our numbers with them, talked about, again, um, the effect that this is having on the school system, and that, according to my calculation, um, that I called the there's a company that represents the town when it comes to unemployment claims. It's called UTMC. And according to that company, um, teachers are able to collect once they've gotten a pink slip right after the close of school. So school closes on June 15th. They can go down the next Monday and file, and two weeks later start receiving compensation for the $1,200,000 of um, salary that has been cut, um, the unemployment um, cost is approximately $9,000 per week. So every week we delay having the election costs the town an additional $9,000. Um, there are 23 people who currently have positions that will not have positions next year um, if this does not happen, if the election does not occur. And uh, um, if the election not only occurs, prevails. Prevails. But the first step is right. making sure that the electorate has the opportunity to speak and to vote. Um, I guess one other thing I should add. And that is, there was the perception among some members of the Board of Selectmen that we could uh, put off the special election until September 15th when the primary election is scheduled to take place. Uh, we were informed by another member of the Board of Selectmen who happens to be an attorney and specializes in administrative law that the law does not allow ballot questions to be added to a primary election. I asked um, this uh, member to make sure he communicated that to other members of the board so that that would not be considered a viable option because it's literally precluded by law. So there is no choice but to either do it uh, this summer or essentially it becomes moot because we'd be well into the school year um, if we waited until November. So I don't consider that to be a viable possibility if we're, if we're serious about um, trying to rehire some teachers and uh, continue with the progress we're making in the uh, educational programs of the, of the district. I think we're finally finished that issue. Um, yes, I was just going to add that um, all of the debt exclusions, there are four debt exclusions. Um, one for school buses for 360,000, one for the high school roof for 110,000, instructional material for 341,000, and the Minot Forest Feasibility Study for 575,000, which we will receive 60% back at least from the state. All of that together is 7.68 cents per thousand on your evaluation of your home. So that on a house that has a valuation of $100,000, it will cost you 
$7.68 per year for five years for all of the debt exclusions. To make that investment in education in the town. And the debt exclusion, which is for 780000 The override. The mean. override. Thank you. Um, we said was $23 for a $100,000 home evaluation because it's 23 cents per $1,000 valuation. And to be clear, these are not school committee numbers. These are uh, assessor and tax collector numbers. Um, so we, we trust that they truly represent the actual burden associated with this um, these debt exclusion and override articles. Mr. Chair? Yes. I just need to say one other thing, which is, you know, in, in addition to the cost for unemployment costs to the town, the other thing to uh, look at when we're talking about delaying a vote is that you have some very, very good teachers and administrators that um, have been laid off, and I know that, um, or have gotten their papers, and I know that if it was me, I would not be waiting until September, August, even tomorrow to start looking for a job. We know that surrounding towns um, have done, you know, this difficult work and have raised taxes and they are not laying off teachers, they're actually hiring. So I just saw that there are, um, you know, three or four positions in Plymouth. There's, you know, it, I've, I've been looking and the positions are out there. So every single day we delay this, we are talking about very good teachers that have committed themselves to Wareham that we have told, thanks, but we just can't afford you. Um, we're losing them to other districts, and that is a huge disservice to our kids. So again, we can, we just can't delay this any longer. Unfortunately, it's worse than that because we also have parents making decisions about children. Yeah. And, um, there is both a financial cost and a cultural cost associated with losing children who want to remain in the school system, but parents being hearing a message and seeing a message that the community isn't willing to invest in the schools, and they're both a terrible situation. So I agree with you, but I think we also can't discount the fact that uh, there are options for parents. Mike, did you want to say something? Uh, I had some questions for Dr. Rabinovich. Sure. Yeah, if I heard you right, you said the day after the school ends, the school year ends, June 16th? June 15th. June 15th. Uh, they can, the teachers can immediately start collecting. They can go down and file, and I believe it takes two weeks before they begin to collect. And if they didn't, regardless, you mentioned, I think, at the last meeting, they get five ch checks on the last day of the school year? Yes, but the way the um, unemployment looks at it, is teachers are paid for 182 or 183 days that they work. Those five checks are set aside f from their 10 months that they get at the end to help them budget through the summer. That's a deferred payment. Okay. They didn't get their full pay during the year. Okay. All right, thank you. You're welcome. That's it. Okay. Your report, sir. Uh, oh, that was my that report. Was report. That I would just wanted to reiterate okay. where we were at. Then we have um, two, two school improvement plans for this evening. The first one will be mine at Forest, and uh, Ms. Joan Siemens is here, and we're glad to have you here, and I know you have some people who you'd like to introduce. And we're ahead of schedule. <laughs> we're ahead of schedule. You just jinxed us. Yeah, please don't do that. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. Welcome, Principal Siemens. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I'm here to present the East Wareham, the Hammond, and the Minot Forest School Improvement Plan. Um, this slide thanks all of my school council members who have worked with me throughout the year. But I also would like to thank Jerry Young, Ann Cody, Denise Tobin, and Jamie Pelletier who were able to come this evening. I know everybody has busy schedules and sports and everything, so I appreciate their support. Um, there's a chair right here next to me if anyone wants to, you know, <laughs> the company, but Come on down. they seem really comfortable where they are right there. So I have some slides. I'm not going to go through everything on these slides. I'm going to highlight some things for you. Um, 
we're just proud of some initiatives that we've been able to do at Mine at Forest, at Hammond, and at East. Uh, this year, as you are aware, and most of the um, community members are aware from various meetings that we've held, we were able to have two part-time meeting interventionist positions added to Mine at Forest, and that was because we started the Response to Intervention Program, RTI. Um, we began that training. By the end of June, we'll have all teachers K-5 to trained. Um, most of the staff have been trained. We just have to finish grades five um, in, at the end of uh, June. We established common planning time for staff if they wanted to take advantage of that for collaboration. So all teachers in grade two have the same block of time off. Their children go to specials. Um, so we were able to do that for them. If you drive by the East Wayham School, you'll see that we have um, a piece of playground equipment that's been installed. So we're proud of that. We're waiting for the, the ground to dry out so we can have the bike pack put it in. And then with a lot of volunteers, we're going to be spreading some mulch. So uh, we thought we had it ready to go last Sunday, but we're not there yet. So we'll be excited when that is finally completed. And I know it comes up later in my plan, but I'm very grateful to the anonymous donor that gave us the money that was able to fund that purchase. And then we had a science fair this year at Minot Forest um, Imagineering Expo, and we appreciate the fact that the funding came from the Foundation for Wayham Education. Um, at the East Wayham School, they went through the NIAC accreditation process. It's a very long, intensive process, and happy to say that they received accreditation. Um, the Village PTA works with us on incentive programs for reading and math. We had our Blast into Books program, our Math Wonders program, Students get awards at the end of the year. We had that last week. Um, great program to help with student achievement. We were successful in our application for the re renovation expansion project at Minot from the MSBA. The articles were passed at town meeting, which just approves the funding in the event the debt exclusion goes through. So we're keeping our fingers crossed. We added a character education program this year at Minot, where every month we have a word of the month it's posted in the newsletter, and as students are caught doing these certain things, um, honesty, being helpful, we post their name on the board. So it's another way of, of trying to instill the positiveness in, in our children. And just about a month ago, six students at Minot Forest won a bullying poster contest through the MARC program at Bridgewater State University. So we're very proud of them for that. I just wanted to give you some highlights of the surveys that were done that we sent out. We did have a better return rate this year. Um, I sent them out as hard copy instead of the technology that we did last year. Um, so for the parent surveys, 34% were returned this year, which is a higher number than we had last year. Um, I may make a, an adjustment next year and send it out one per family because I noticed um, some comments were duplicated and it came from the same household. So. I think just to be fair and accurate, we'll try to limit it to one per family. Um, so just looking at the numbers, they really look good. We're in the, the 80s to the 90s, which is where I would hope to see um, parents being satisfied with school safety and security, discipline, promotion and respect and understanding of people with diverse backgrounds, school enjoyment, um, staff assisting, encouraging students to achieve their goal, the feeling of being valued and respected, and the only one that was really the highest number in the negative was the feeling that school rules and discipline are fair. There was 11% of parents felt um, that was an area to strengthen, whereas the majority of the parents felt that it was not an issue. And when you see the range, 92 to 100%, that just depends on what particular school it was. So I took the range of all three, separated it out this year. John, just a, just a quick point, and I understand your feeling, but the, the flip side of it, if I had two children in my household, both going to your school, which I'm sure exists at, in, at times, they might have completely different experiences. And if you only give one per family, those completely different experiences would not be reflected. So I can see your point, but I can also see that point. So I, I wouldn't necessarily conclude that you they shouldn't have the right to, to uh, return surveys that reflect the two different experiences. So there is a spot at the end of the survey for comments. So that could be a, a place where a parent could write a comment on the, the different experiences. But if it's the same comment and it didn't matter what grade the child was in, that's where I started to see some duplication. 
but I it's don't worth feel strongly about it. I just don't want parents to, to think that we think every child has the same experience. Right. Right. That's, I think, a good place why we have the comment place. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes, go ahead. I think that um, the results that you're about to move on to, what I liked was that you did break it out by school. I think this is an important one to be able to see um, for each school also. Um, so if, if we can, I'd love to be able to get that data. And the only other question is, I see that it's kind of peppered in staff assisting, um, staff assisting and encouraged, no, uh, feeling of being valued and respected by all staff. But do you ask a question regarding parents who feel that they're a, um, I've seen in some of the other surveys that they're being heard or that they feel that they have involvement in their child's education, you know, that kind of, that kind of question instead of just feeling, uh, being valued and respected. Do you ever dive down in any of the surveys in the past and ask a question like that? We've been using the same standard survey, and I know last year the administrators got together and we looked at the, the sentences that we had on it. Um, not to that degree, but it's certainly something we can look at next year when we're looking to, add, to uh, redo the questions or add questions. Okay. So we could look at that. Um, and then in the school improvement plan on page 15, I did break it out by school. I just didn't do it on the slide, so um, I put like at mine at him at east. So you'll see there that's where um, you'll get more detailed information. Thanks. Uh, staff survey: seventy-two percent of the staff completed, uh, which was a great percentage higher than we had from last year. So it is broken out here: school safety, the percentage of staff that is satisfied. We range from sixty-three to seventy-five percent. At Minot Forest, 67% of the staff um, are satisfied with discipline. School culture, we range from 53 up to 100% at East. Um, the area that we need to strengthen was that at Hammond, 75% of the staff or 100% of the staff at East are dissatisfied with discipline. When I look through the comments for East, um, mainly it's some of the significant behaviors of some of our students coming in who, because they're three years old, we really are just starting to work with them. So we really need to teach them a lot about proper behavior. It could be their disabilities are lending to some aggressive behaviors because they're not verbal, they don't know how to communicate otherwise. And the issue came up again that there wasn't a designated on-site administrator in that building. I know we've taken care of that for next year, but that's some of the reasons why we saw such a higher percentage. And it wasn't that they were completely dissatisfied, they just said it needed improvement. So that pushed it into the neg negative category. Yes. So, Joan, just to make sure I'm clear, so 47% of staff are dissatisfied with the school culture. I, I see 53% are satisfied, but that means almost half your staff at Minot are dissatisfied with the school culture. And a lot of times, the time of the year that you send out the survey has an impact on the percentage. So as we're talking about a lot of the budget cuts and um, back in April when we were talking about layoffs, that brings down morale and that's where you start to see some of these numbers reflect what's going on in the building. So you're feeling that the 47% is reflective of the, when the survey was sent out, it was also when we were talking about having to lay off 22 teachers. Right. That has had a huge impact towards the end of the school year. Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, just to build on that, I, I think that uh, uh, I have to add my two cents on that only because I've spent a lifetime uh, either in administration or in the classroom. And we've been beating up teachers pretty well. Uh, we've been beating them up pretty well. We've been asking them to do more with less consistently. And we've been doing it for years to do more with less. Mm -hmm. um, the general culture, uh, the lack of support, the lack of commitment um, locally, and, and, the, and you could call it what you want, but the teacher's perception is there's a lack of commitment to support them in what they do. So all of that lends itself into a, a culture that is, is less than happy, um, to say the least. So I think that, um, yes, it may, it, may, it may be indicative of some internal situations, but I think there are a lot of other external factors that play into that. And, and uh, I think we've gotta be real careful then to jump to conclusions and to leap to conclusions that may, may, may or may not be accurate. That's just my two cents. 
we tried to do some after school activities with the staff just you know time away from school just to be together you know put school aside and and just share and be with each other um, just to try to build just some morale when we do have tough times I, I can I can certainly understand how layoffs can cause a morale issue but I I would hope that the word culture would go far beyond the I, issue. That's not the only issue. You're right. Right. Um, how do you think the teacher, the typical teacher, understands what culture means in this question? What do you think they, how do they define culture when they're responding? I think that they're looking at a variety of topics. They're looking at what, what's happening for professional development, what are we doing for in service. We have the new teacher evaluation system that's coming down. There's a lot of new initiatives that they were taking on this year, the RTI. A lot of new things that, and they had time out of their classrooms because we had to provide the professional development. That all kind of goes into their school culture as well. What they feel as um, what they're doing not only in their classroom, but how it's affecting their everyday life in the classroom and in that school. So it's kind of, they're looking at it globally. So there's a lot of factors that kind of go into this. But I appreciate that, but I think this school committee, and, and I believe you and Dr. Rabinovich would say that the changes that you're talking about, whether it's RTI, ILs, new curriculums, et cetera, are all, even parents have expressed that these are very positive and constructive changes. So I'm concerned that I'm inferring, and maybe I shouldn't, that your staff does not necessarily concur that these are constructive, positive changes. No, I would disagree. They're positive changes. It's just take them out of the classroom for the training. And that, the teachers love to be there with their, with their children. So it, it kind of, they need the training to do what we need, but they're away from the children. And that's what, that's what they were saying. Just a lot of initiatives that took them away. All new things produce stress. Um, Jan and I have met with separate groups of teachers about the, you attended one of the sessions about the new evaluation system. There is a lot of distrust until they see it actually implemented. It's it's being talked about, um, but that affects this. I would also say, and nobody has mentioned it, that there are things that are not within our control. Right. There may be uh, particular disciplinary things that occur with certain children that have the rights to their education that staff and or parents on occasion wonder um, would be happier if that particular child wasn't in that school. That may not be politically correct to say, but it does affect the culture of a building. And there are times, just by the pendulum going up and down, that we have more of them in a particular year than other years because of some um, health issues related to children. And I don't want to go much further than that because of identification. But there are things that um, cause culture, and as Joan said, the timing of it, and having been a building principal for 12 years, I can tell you that the timing has a lot to do with how this particular question is answered. And um, some people would like things to be done differently. It doesn't mean that they don't think that the changes are positive, but they are tired of change happening every year. Unfortunately, that is what we have to do because of the state and federal government. Curriculum is changing, materials are changing, evaluation is changing. So um, I would hope once things kind of reach a homostasis that we would see the culture rise on this question. Don't hold your breath on that. Yes. <laughs> I'm sorry that we're belaboring this point and taking a look at it. Okay, but when I, I have a lot of wonderful comments, so it's not just that culture no, is, is low. Right. Uh, no, I the culture's not low. It's perception of the culture that right. might be low. 
me though, when I take a look at a 40, 47% dissatisfaction with the culture and I think about culture and I think about um, even in the, um, in the job market that you can put whatever percentage you want on it, but if the, if the employees um, are, un, are not satisfied with the culture, that translates into their job and mm -hmm. how they're doing their job. And so I take it one step further when I'm taking a look at that. If I'm having, if I don't feel that work, if I feel like they're constantly changing things on me, if I feel that they're, I have no control, if I, all that kind of stuff, I'm sorry, it is gonna translate into the way that I show up to work every single day and how I actually do my job. And so that's the reason why I have a concern here. So there could be a million outside forces, but we still do have to do something about changing this number and, and, and increasing this number because again, at the end of the day, it translated in how we're educating our children. And that's Great. to me just unacceptable that it's 47% are dissatisfied with the culture. Just an opinion. Okay. Continue, Moving please. On. Well, I, no. I, I just, I or just try think. to continue. Go ahead, Cliff. <laughs> no, no. I, I agree with everything the preceding speaker said. Everything, you know, in terms of manifesting itself into, into job performance. But, okay, the bottom line is, okay, you've got a workforce that every time we put something on their plate, we're not taking anything off. And now, don't tell me that that's not going to manifest itself over years, and we've been doing it. Now, am I saying that it, it may lead to um, a, a lackadaisical approach to their job? In some cases, yes. But I haven't seen that to be the case globally. I've seen teachers that have risen above it consistently, year in and year out, face those obstacles, face those problems, face those new initiatives that we put on their plate, and, and dealt with it. So, and I think that the proof is in the pudding, you know, in terms of our test performances, even though, even though we're not where we should be, I haven't seen a huge dip either. So the point is, the more that we ask our people to do, whether it be teachers, custodians, administrators, the more we ask them to do with less, it's going to affect their attitudes towards their work. And I'm not saying that I'm not going to make a giant leap and saying, well, they're going to be, they're going to be doing substandard work. I, I, I want to subscribe to that. But yes, in some cases it may you know, affect what they do. Because you know, at some point in time, you get kicked in the head so long, you know, you're ducking for cover before you even uh, see it coming. So the, that's, that's number one point. The second point is those external factors that manifest themselves into the school. Those external factors. Now, I know for a fact that you had, a, you had an administrator's coffee one morning and one person showed up. One parent showed up to, to the parent's coffee that morning. That manifests itself into the school. You know, we can, we can point and we can say, well, what's wrong with the school culture? But I say the school culture is a representation of the culture at large. And when we've got a school of 700 students and one parent, shows up for an open coffee, that's indicative not only of the school <coughs> culture, but the culture at large. I so, think we could spend the rest of the evening. Yes, we could. I'm sorry. So, so all of these questions so that we have, <coughs> staff, parents, students are able to list the positives and the negatives. And next year, one of my main things to do is to do a new vision statement for our schools. And when you do a new vision statement, you have to look at all this information and build that into the vision. So it is in my plan to do for next year. So moving on. Uh, for students, the percentage of students, again, these are great numbers. The lowest one we see here, uh, mine it, our school rules are fair. I would expect to see some students, they don't like to lose recess, they don't like detention, they don't like out of school suspension or in school suspension. But we follow the discipline code. Um, but still, 89% is a, is a great number. The lowest ones, um, and this breaks my heart, I read almost every day. That's where we see our lowest percentage. 77% of students at Hammond said they read almost every day. 79% at Minot. Um, I'd like to even get that up more. So in the student comment section, I just pulled out a couple. The students like math, phys ed, music, art, recess, science, and their teachers. They like math? Yes. Interesting. Um, some do not like homework, recess, and study skills, but they were very clear they liked the teacher, they just didn't like study skills. So they made that distinction. Um, 
we have a great program. She does a lot of work on writing and informational text and things like that. So um, it's not phys ed that you can go out and run around and, and be active. So what I'm doing now is just going through some reviewing the current goals that we did this year. Um, so for student achievement, some of the activities that we did to, meet, to reach this goal was the RTI training and implementation. We had student support programs such as the CARE program that we ran this year. Um, SES is the tutoring that we were able to offer to students. We had common assessments that we gave to all grade levels, which was DIBBLES, um, the grade and the GMAID. The GMAID was the math one. Um, we had several staff from the summer to the, during the year that attended various DSAC math workshops, so they were able to carry that information over into the classroom. And then the instructional leaders, as well as the administrators, completed um, observation and walkthroughs. So we have the ways that we measured that progress. Um, I'll keep going for now. Technology, we had the grade four that piloted the iPads and we had a presentation a few weeks ago um, from my fourth graders. We held training for Rubicon Atlas for the teachers, um, also training for Pearson Inform. These are things that we'll be able to implement for next year. Power School Power Grade training was held, so the teachers are using Power Grade to input their progress reports and their report card grades. And Lexia and Study Island were a software that we were able to use with the students. And in addition, we used one uh, for some students called SumDog, and that's another one that we're looking at expanding for next year. For the community, um, we want to keep building the, our communication using Global Connect. Fortunately, I had to use it a couple times this week, and we had to cancel field day because of the weather. Um, but we have rescheduled them, which is great. That gives me a percentage of how many parents I'm able to reach every time I make a call. We use the local media, which we are appreciative of that. We had 43 articles that appeared in newspapers this year. I always do my principal's monthly newsletter. I use the email for a PTA and school council. We were able to see at Minot Forest that 65% of parents have an email address in there. They don't always work, but it at least we're starting to capture them, so we can work on that piece for next year. We want to keep building partnerships with our community. The Reading is Fundamental Week, having community readers come in to read to our students. And the Cape Cod Symphony Music in the morning program started at Hammond this year, and the students really enjoyed that. So I've already contacted Mrs. Ames and the representative to incorporate that next year. Just to be clear, this is not the New Bedford Symphony program, no. this is the Cape Cod Symphony program. Cape Cod. So they have competing music in the morning program. They do. Okay. <laughs> Mr. Chair? Yes. I have a question regarding the 65% of minor parent emails are stored in power schools. What would you say um, is the percentage of teachers um, at Minot and or Hammond that are comfortable with using email as a form of communication with parents? It depends on the teacher, but I know a lot of my staff at Minot, because that's where I get a lot of the communication from the staff, do communicate back and forth with parents. Um, by email. Do I? By email? By email, yes. Is the expectation set with all teachers that if they're uncomfortable, that really this is the world that we're living in and, and that most of the, um, the parents of the children, this is how they're communicating now. I mean, I would even like us to go so far one day as <laughs> texting or, you know, wish, you know, <laughs> I know. But uh, having, mo most parents instead of Global Connect will probably read a text of something that's going on, you'll get to them a lot faster. But even if we can get to, you know, that that is where we're at now and most of the parents are more comfortable with email than having to call or having to write a note in. And right. so, you know, are we trying to encourage or try or something to be able to get the teachers that are not so comfortable, more comfortable, or at least the expectation to set that that's the norm, and the norm that communicating with parents is, is through email? We can't use email for notes during the day. If yes. If we, we can. In, when I go through my goals when we get to the end of the year, as you are aware, because I think you sat with Terry and I mm -hmm. earlier in the year, we have a pilot going where we have some teachers that are working with power grade or elementary to open that up. And the reason I'm mentioning this is because then there'll be a list of assignments 
there'll be the quick look up like we have at the secondary school and that there'll be a click by the parent that will be able to get the email of the teacher and then right back the teacher will be able to answer it right back so that's where we're heading so that what you're asking for about the communication with email will be happening um, next year but that will roll out as part of and so it will, it will include <coughs> I have a concern the teacher has a concern that's going on in the classroom with Absolutely. the child and where yep. the parent has a concern is that we need to make sure that that communication is flowing back and forth between the parent and sometimes the parent saying all right I have to find time to make sure that I can call them at what time it's just I'm experiencing right now so you know yes. it would just be the email will thanks. go a lot smoother and that I'm fine with it's just I don't want a parent to email the teacher in the morning and expect an answer back because if they have their prep first thing in the morning no, they won't I'm check email it. the rest no, of the day not when I'm looking what's right so it's the expectation that's basically said yeah, it's just that the communication I don't use school. email yeah. so you have to call and that's yeah. what the culture Everybody that we have to change thanks right um, resources as we know our application was accepted by MSBA um, there was a building committee that was established we're just waiting to go now we did apply for grants through Make Peace Foundation for Wayham Education. We were able to get those grants. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the anonymous donation allowed us to have a structure at East, and East got their NIAC accreditation. <coughs> Hammond had to do their annual report to keep their accreditation, and we were able to keep it for another five years. So again, a lot of hard work, and I thank the staff and Mrs. Ames for taking care of that. New goals, so this is looking forward now. Um, we need to train the remaining staff for RTI that will take place at the end, end of June, at the um, end of the school year. We're looking to purchase additional literacy materials for informational text that's required by the Common Core Standards. We're working with our curriculum director on that. Um, part of it may depend on the debt exclusion. <coughs> Student support programs, um, the tutoring program will be changing a little bit. Instead of SES, which was based on income, working with Mr. Lozan, um, having tutoring available to a wide variety of students, not just students who are low income, um, continuing our care program. Just to be clear, you're going to be able to do that with your current budget? The, what, the student support programs? These are grants, with grants. SES, that we've had. my understanding is SES primarily has Title changed. One, correct? Yeah, there has right. been a change in the Title I regulations and therefore we will be able to use it for tutoring for all children that need it versus just the particular economic. That is a change that has happened this So I mentioned spring. Mr. Lozan, it comes from his office. His, That's great news. That's, That's very good news. That is yes. really, really good news. That is awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You'd be happy with that, Jamie. Mm -hmm. um, and then PTA, again, continuing our Blast Into Books program because the children have to read for a total of 240 minutes, and they turn in their reading logs once they do, and they travel around the world, which is the bulletin board, and they receive incentives for that. So that has been a great success. And then we have classrooms that like to compete with each other to see who's read the most minutes. Um, they also do the math incentive program, so we'll continue that as well. And we'd like to increase student participation in Study Island, if that's what we are still going to use next year, in some dog, which we may be looking at um, trying to increase the usage with that. Some dog, you, the students can go on and can compete with students in Scotland. Um, you can narrow down what math skills you want them to work on. It gives us reports. It's free right now. So um, then they set up these uh, contests at times. And one of our second graders um, was the top person to, um, for the scores that they got in the math. So. The students are excited and the teachers have liked piloting that this year. For technology, <coughs> continuing student participation with various equipment, we'd like to hope we can continue the iPad use. I know there'll be discussions about where we use those for next year. Um, Pearson and Form will be able to implement to use for our data collection, which will really be helpful for the teachers because they'll have data at their fingers, which will be needed to um, for tiered instruction, for our TAC meetings, of strategies for children, and we'll train staff on any new te technology in initiatives. I know we're looking at possibly going to Gmail instead of something different, so any new technology initiatives we have, we'll make sure that the staff have the training. 
community, um, expand communications with families, and this is what we want to do, um, Rhonda, survey them to see what is their preferred means of communication. So we would like to decrease the number of paper copies that we send home and hopefully increase the electronic usage. So if I can email a parent the newsletter versus copying it and sending it home, that would be great. And then we want to sustain our current partnerships, expand if we can. Um, PTA does a lot of great things with our students. This year we were able to go back to field trips You know, for every grade level. They bring enrichment programs into our students. The reading is fundamental. Um, with the guest readers. There's also the reading this fundamental book distribution. We give students in um, pre-K and K three books a year. And that's available through the Dick Maloney Foundation because they give us the funds to purchase the books. And then we have this new pilot YMCA program that we're looking at for grade three for next year, a swim program. So another way of, of working with our community members. And they put on, the PTA puts on great fundraisers. And we, in fact, we had a meeting last night, and we're looking at some different companies for next year. So we're excited for um, some of the things that we may be able to host for next year. And everything that comes in from fundraisers goes right back out for the students. So, for resources, we need to complete the feasibility study for Mine at Forest. So we're hopefully going to get that successful passage of debt exclusion and the funding. Um, with the elimination of the assistant principal position at Hammond. We need to examine all possible scenarios for the kindergarten location and the supervision of Hammond. I know that's to be determined yet. I'll be working with um, Dr. Rabinovich on that and in staff. We'll continue to Mr. submit Chair. our grants. Um, I have a One meeting. One second, John. Yeah, sorry. Just before you move on from the point, so is the um, is the discussion throughout this summer talking about going into next year? So there is talk about. Um, moving kindergarten from Hammond to someplace else. All right, and those are discussions we'll have to have once we know for sure if there's an override and if we are successful in passing an override. For the expansion of the building? For, for relocating for Hammond. Okay. okay. Go ahead, go ahead. <clears throat> it is dependent on whether or not the override passes and whether or not there are classroom space available um, for the kindergarten. If, if the override passes, I don't have the classroom space at Minot, so kindergarten definitely stays at Hammond. If the override does not pass, then I have two scenarios. I have Hammond that could stay at, the kindergarten could stay at Hammond, but there will not be an assistant principal in that building. Or I move the kindergarten students over to Minot Forest. So it's not a decision we can make right now, it's, we have to, Reevaluate one state. Yes. Yeah. Town decides. And then reconfigure class assignments and special education programs. That's again based on what we know, what we're going to have to staff, um, and make sure <coughs> our special ed programs are efficient with the, with the staffing that we have. So I've given a projection of what class size could look like next year. So in grade one, we currently have five classes. If we were to keep our, all of our teachers, or we hire the teachers back that received their layoff notices, we're at 19 to 20 students per class. If I have to reduce by one, we're at 24, 25 students for grade one. For grade two, um, if I keep the five classes, they'd have 22 to 23 students per class. If we reduce by one to four, they're at 28 students next year. Grade three, there's 125 students. This is my bubble class, so I have to keep the five classes. That still gives them 28 students per class. I just put the number in there. I cannot reduce grade three by one because they'd be 31, 32, and that's just not acceptable. Grade four, there's 101 students currently. Um, if we kept the five classes, they'd have 20, 21 students, but if I reduce them by one, then they're at 25, 26. In grade five with 112, Right now they have five classes, they'd be at 22, 23, but if I reduce them by one, they'd be at 28 students per class. So the bold items are what will take place if those positions are not restored. Um, so there's five classroom positions plus one, four classroom positions, study skills, and a phys ed. Currently we have 101 new registrations for kindergarten. We have six retentions, so we have a total of 107 students. 
I currently have 106 kindergarten students. So this potentially could be a larger class that's coming in because we still have the summer that we get through where we typically have new registrations. So this could be an, another potentially bigger class. John, since the announcement that we were going to full day free kindergarten, have you seen an increase in people signing up? Or is that, that news really not gotten out yet and we haven't really seen a big This week one? we're sending out the letters to inform parents about the change. Um, but it hasn't really changed the registrations because we captured most of the registrations. We just have to make sure they're aware of the full day program versus the opt out um, portion of it. But if a parent comes to a meeting of an older student and we know there's a kindergarten child, we're catching them right then and there to register their child. And that's the end of that. Questions? Mike? No, I don't have any. Rhonda? I didn't ask it when you were going through that slide, but the community goals, when you, um, Talk about expand communications with families by surveying deferred means of communication. Are you also planning to, or could you expand that to talk about um, parent involvement? You know, again, we, we talk about parent involvement in the middle and parent involvement in the high school, but, and I know that the PTA does a great job, and, but there it seems like this core group that are involved in the schools, um, but that it's really hard to break that barrier to get more parents involved. Um, if you're already going to be surveying them to talk about means of communication, is there an easy one or two question um, piece that we can talk about how to, you know, what would be their preferred means of um, being engaged in the school? Is it, um, you know, from home, so doing things from home, or is it, you know, after school? It just, you know, some way that we can take a pulse of, um, of all of the, the parents that are going to be at MineEd and, and the other um, schools to try to get them um, engaged. One of the requests from last year was increasing communication. So by hosting the principal's coffee, um, I started at the beginning of the, I think in September I had a morning coffee and then it didn't help some of the parents that were working. So I always did two, I did a morning and an evening one. And we did get an increase in parents that would come to that but it seemed to be a different group of parents that would go to the PTA meetings. Mm -hmm. So I, I need to have them work collaboratively. Um, and they were great information that came out of both sets of, of groups and meetings, but um, we do want, want to make sure that we're capturing everybody. Okay. Into that. Okay. Good. Um, <clears throat> talking about community, I think that uh, <clears throat> I've mentioned it at the high school before it's something that I did at my school, but it's certainly something that could be done at uh, the elementary level. And, and those are principal round tables, student round tables at the high school level, but certainly parent round tables. Um, you know, feed them and they will come. And we provide- Oh, I do at the principal's right. coffee. That's, well, mm -hmm. that's <laughs> good. PTA. So- Not a PTA, a school council. Uh, we sent a formal invitation out that th they were randomly selected and we, we just tried to do it that way. And we usually get, we usually got about 60 to 65% participation which is really good. But that being said, uh, I say this every year and it's no indication, uh, no um, indication as to the uh, thoroughness of your report, but I say it every year and I'll say it again, uh, things that we have to do, I don't consider as goals. So we, we have to do the training for the RTI. So I, I personally don't consider that a goal because it's just something we have to do. Um, but the thing that I, I'm most amazed at and you know I'd be remiss if I didn't make mention of it is we want to talk about school culture put 28 or 30 kids in the classroom uh, I'm sure I'm sure that that will take its toll uh, by June uh, in these teachers they'll be absolutely exhausted um, given the set of circumstances that we're working on given the socioeconomic situation that we have in our school system given the transient population that we have in our school system, given uh, students with special needs that we have in our school system, uh, given the fact that we have shrinking resources in our school system, the fact that we're putting 27 and 28 kids in the classroom at the elementary, the early elementary level is criminal. It's criminal. I, I just can't put it any other way as an educator. 
and I have to sit here on the school committee and say, oh, that's just what we have to do. Well, you know what? It, it's, it's just, a, it, it almost makes me want to vomit uh, to think that that's what we'll come down to. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Joan, I notice on your data that you have 300 of your 563 students uh, are low income. Is there any evidence that this increase, which is now 53%, is having an impact on your ability to educate children? Or is it basically an interesting demographic fact but is irrelevant to the educational process? I don't think it's inter interacting with the um, educational purpose, but I, I just see a difference in the families and the stress level of families, and it's transferring down to the children. So we may see more behaviors with the children because the families can't provide what they need for their children. Um, and then the, the children don't have what they would like to have. So that's where I'm seeing the impact of the economy that we have right now. Not that we can't provide what we need for them. Um, I think we had more students you know, in, involved in the care program. We have to limit the amount of students that we can have involved in that. And there's usually a waiting list. So parents yep. want their children to be involved. Um, they're willing to have them involved. But I don't see it as an educational interference. I just see it as just um, the stress of everything. So there's no indication that the parents care less, and there's no indication that these children have any more or less difficulty learning? Based on economy, no. Do we have parents challenging us when we try to discipline their students? Yes, but it has nothing to do with the economy. <laughs> right, exactly. OK. Um, I think I spoke about this last year, but this year it's even more dramatic, and that is your fifth grade, not just yours, but actually Dicus as well, the SGP, student growth percentile, for fifth grade math in this district is off the charts positive, 62%, which for those of you watching or here, means that it's more than 20% better than average for the entire Commonwealth of Massachusetts. That's really significant, especially given the district is at 42%. So my question is, given the fact that these are, this is a cohort of 226 kids. That's a big cohort. This isn't just a few bright kids. Right. What are we doing right in the fifth grade of this district to make those numbers happen. We actually had a great fifth grade group last year as well. Exactly. And I'd say the biggest thing that we did right was the everyday math program. That really has raised the bar for students for math. Stop. Sixth grade math for the district, those same fifth graders. <clears throat> when did we implement was last year was the first year of this new math program. Right. So they didn't the children have who were in fifth grade last year got the new math right. curriculum. The children in this year's fifth grade are getting the new math curriculum. So this year's sixth grade class is the fifth grade that, that had, had the new math curriculum last year. And we implemented the new math curriculum this year at the middle school for th that same math program grade six so we don't have the scores yet right. this year we right. did do the new thing right. yes and I, one to the other. I that's that was my point yeah. so the children who are sitting in grade six had the new math curriculum last year and are having it this year and I believe that the scores will also show that the SGP has increased for our grade six because after analyzing the problem, we put a new curriculum in at the elementary school two years ago. And as I've said before up here, it takes time to show the improvement. And this is two years of it, and let's continue with it. 
last two years ago was the first fifth was the first fifth grade class with this new curriculum, correct? Last year. One year. One year. One year. So there's because as I said, I thought a year ago we were looking at data that also showed an anomalous positive for fifth graders. But they were the first year of having that new curriculum. Fair, fair enough. But they would now be, for these data, they would be now sixth graders. I agree, but in 2010. They did not have the They didn't have everyday math they did that not particular have year. I don't know what curriculum they had, but I'm saying I believe, I could be wrong, they, there was also an extraordinary positive in fifth grade. You don't think that's the case? No. Okay, so what you're saying is when we get the SGP data for the sixth graders for 2012, we should continue to see this significant improvement. Yes, sir. I look forward to it. Okay. So don't I. <laughs> I also like that at fifth grade that we have the teams. <laughs> yeah. At fifth grade we have the teaming. So we have two teachers that are team teaching. So one teacher is teaching math to two sections of students. Because the sixth graders, your fifth grade across the district is at 62 for math. Sixth graders are at 37. So for sixth graders, for 2012, the, what we've essentially completed now, if that's now dramatically up into the high 50s or 60s, that will mean that's a huge change and a hugely positive change and should give all of us hope that we finally have what we need mm -hmm. to solve the math problem in this district. I'll be waiting with great anticipation to see those numbers. Anything else for Joan? Mike? Um, just to build on something that you brought up earlier, and I thank you for asking the question about the economics and the and how that impacts learning. Uh, I was curious, and you, you seem to say it doesn't impact it. You, you're not seeing it. And I'm just I'm just wondering, are, are these students able to access the extracurricular stuff as well? You know, band, um, destination, imagination. Are they, are they do they participate? Yes, they do. They do. Um, and there, one of the pages in my plan it shows you exactly how many people participate. So we have band and chorus, we have intramurals. In addition to the, the care and the tutoring. So if you look on page 14 of the plan, it lists um, intramurals care, the tutoring, band instruction, chorus, recorder, um, jump rope for heart we do once a year. We have a grade five yearbook committee, destination imagination. Uh, we do the punt, pass, and kick. We have a grade five newspaper, and then student news and review. So it ranges on their participation. So they do access it. Great, thank you. All set, Mike? All set, thank you. Joan, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Joan. Thank good you, luck, Joan. and thank you for Thanks. And thank you, staff, for us. Another good year. I will. And thank you, school council members. Mr. Palladino, Hello. welcome. Thank you. So do you have anybody with you or you're all by yourself? I gave him the night off. <laughs> oh, magnanimous. It's been a long month for <laughs> high school. And tomorrow night, um, we didn't mention it before, but tomorrow night is the underclassmen um, academic awards at Larian High School at 7 o'clock at the um, high school auditorium. I just I came from there when I when I got here. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Thank you. And we have sixth grade on Monday. And I think tomorrow is introduction of sixth graders to middle school. Yes.
Okay. <clears throat> so what I've done for you today is uh, I've broken this presentation up into thirds and basically uh, just cut and pasted a little bit from uh, the school improvement plan that you have, uh, I believe you received last Friday. So there's, th again, there's three parts. The first part, uh, I just want to touch upon the process for creating this plan. Um, even though we gave the school council the night off, we had input from them uh, most recently in the last two meetings. Uh, as uh, Dr. Sylvia mentioned, uh, we meet with the students through leadership team meetings and roundtable meetings to get their input. We met with department heads to get their input. We met, met with staff several times to get their input. Parents, uh, also this would be through, through the survey as well. Uh, other administrations such as the deans and the assistant principal, central administration, the analysis, the analysis of the NIAS report, and the analysis of the student, parent, staff, and the mass tell surveys. Most importantly, we looked at the needs of our students. I didn't give you everything off the parent survey, um, but I wanted to give you some of the That was me. Sorry. <laughs> so, <laughs> I wanted to give you, I'm not used to these speakers. I wanted to give you uh, some of the positives and some of the negatives and some of that was in between um, we left off. but. Uh, this was the parent survey. We mailed out 100 self-addressed stamped envelopes. We received 19 back. Uh, this was a little bit better than the email um, that survey that we did last year, but we did get 19. And again, we mailed these out with self-addressed envelopes to return back to the school. Um, so we spent about $44 on that, and we got 19 back. Uh, the good news is we got some, some positive responses and, and some areas that uh, we kind of felt were positive. but. Uh, Safety uh, was a huge uh, hit with parents. We do, I think we do a great job in regards to the safety of the children at Wareham High School. 95% uh, feel their child is safe in school. 89% uh, feel their child enjoys school. Uh, and what I'm really happy about, which was, uh, as you may remember, one of my goals uh, last year was my child knows at least one adult in school who knows him or her. So I'm very excited about that. 100% felt they had one adult. And I think that's because of the dean system the guidance system that was always in place um, and the advisory system. So very excited about that. 95% uh, feel their child uh, feels valued, respected at school by the teachers, counselors, and administrators. So that, that was the parent survey. That was kind of the highlights of the parent survey. Mr. Chair? Student survey. Second, oh, Scott. I'm sorry. Yes. Scott, sorry. So you have 744 students that go to Wareham High School. Why were only 100 sent out? Dr. Binovich? Uh, because of the random, is that correct? You used the random number generator and random sample to take approximately 10 percent um, of the population is so instead of sending it to everybody you do a random sample and it is just as valid in fact it's more valid than mailing it to everyone not if you get 19 back 19 out of 100 when it's random is better than when we mail out 700 and you get 20 back okay since the only other thing that I would say is that why aren't we doing both when email doesn't cost us anything? Why aren't we sending that? We, we, we did we that last year, and I, the response was uh, I, I believe we received 11 back. On All the I'm end. saying is that if, if we're going to, if we're basically saying that we're going to send them out through um, mail, Still and mail. email doesn't cost us anything, it doesn't hurt us to do both. Sure. We'll, we'll give that a, a try next year. Student survey, uh, not including the seniors, uh, we uh, surveyed the underclassmen and uh, some parallels here, 85% feel safe in school. Um, a little change here, 60% enjoy school, a uh, little concern there. 75% uh, feel they know at least one adult and 71% uh, feel they are uh, valued, respected at school by the teachers, counselors, and administrators. Any yes. Question? Sure. How's the question asked, enjoy school? Agree, uh, do you, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, I, I have all the uh, surveys, and I know Dr. Brinovich is going to come down and check on them. Uh, I believe the question is, uh, which one, in the safety or the, the do, you, do you feel uh, safe in the high school? And then it's uh, a, a strongly agree, agree, uh, disagree, strongly disagree. Uh, the enjoy what about school? enjoys? Enjoy, uh, do you enjoy school, I believe, is the way the question is worded. Yeah, we might want to look, want to look at that question. We had the same conversation when it came to West Wareham Academy, and if you basically ask the student whether they enjoy school, if somebody told me that, I, do I enjoy work? Like, really? Mm -hmm. So it's basically, you know, what are we, what are we hoping to get sure. out of that question? You know, 
and I don't know if it's you know in, in joy in a way that I'd rather be here than going to Waterways. Right. It's, it's more do they feel that it is a quality environment to have right. an educational experience or whatever. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, teacher survey, um, sim similar questions. Uh, students, do they feel safe in school? 93% felt the students are safe in school. Uh, school promotes respect and understanding of people with diverse backgrounds. 99% agree. This is a concern, and this is actually a driving factor, as you'll see uh, in one of my school improvement goals. Uh, communication between the parents and teachers is satisfactory, and 53% agree, 47% disagree. and. Uh, I found this interesting, and Jan, I think you will as well. We can make improvements to our instructional uh, program, and 95% agree. So I, I definitely, that's something we're going to concentrate on as well as part of our school improvement program. So, so it's fair, is it fair to say you've had power school for a number of years now. So the actual technical ability for parents and teachers to communicate is there. I mean, it's it's not a problem. It's literally the click of a mouse. If there's a will, there's definitely a way. So the problem is not technology. The problem is, as you point out, the will to communicate. It, it's so easy um, once you get on. I mean, you're clicking the name of the teacher, and it gives you their email address, and there's instant communication. The teachers, as uh, Joan mentioned, you know, they check during their prep. They check their emails. Uh, for the most part, they're very good about getting back to people, whoever it is, whether it be administration, fellow teacher, or parent. It's, it's a great tool. Uh, what, uh, and I'm sure when Terry does her presentation, you'll see the percentage of parents that use it. Um, it could be used a whole lot more by the parents to, to check in on their students, uh, to see what's going on. And uh, unfortunately, it's used by uh, uh, not a great percentage, not, not as great as we'd like anyway. Mr. Chair, the, yes. one of the issues with this particular question is um, when we look at the data of who uses PowerSchool at the middle school, overwhelmingly it's parents. When we move to the high school, it's overwhelmingly students and not parents. And so part of it is that children wanting to become a more independent and parents, um, maybe it's my third child and I'm getting a little tired at that time, but for whatever reason, they do communicate less and that's what you're seeing there. The teachers would like to have more Teacher and I think the part of the reason why the number is skewed as well is um, during advisory period, the students are required at different points in time to log in and show their advisory teacher where, they, where their standings are in regards to their classes. Uh, so I know that's why the numbers are skewed a little bit more maybe than they would be in most schools in regards to the percentage of students that are uh, logging in versus the percentage of parents. I really like this survey uh, because we had almost everyone involved and it was anonymous and um, it was web-based and there's some things that um, you know I certainly want to take a look at but uh, what concerns me is the first one. Um, class sizes are reasonable such that teachers have time available to meet the needs of the students and 23 percent agreed and uh, obviously as we know uh, the class size is going to change. Just to be clear, who are the respondents? These are teachers. all teachers. All teachers. Teachers. And does that 61 mean 61% of your staff No, responded? 61 teachers. Everyone. 61 of your teachers responded to this. Correct. Out of? 62.5. <laughs> okay, so almost all the teachers. Correct. And this was a statewide survey that was done. And we'll be bringing later um, district-wide data on this. But this is the high schools. <coughs> Um, I'm happy with this one with the change in the schedule. Teachers are protected from duties that interfere with their essential role of educating students. I'm not sure where the 28% that disagree go, but basically, as, as you remember, last year we got rid of the duties, we changed the schedule, teachers picked up an extra period, and uh, it's been going really well. I'm, I'm happy that 82% recognize that. I'm not sure where the other 28% are, but that's, uh, I think that's a good number. Um, and this kind of parallels with the previous question. Families help students achieve educational goals in the school. 26% agree, 74% uh, disagree. Scott, I, I hate to be picky, but 82 and 28 adds up to 110. Oh, excuse me, sorry. <laughs> 18, excuse me. Okay. Some, uh, social services are available to ensure that all students are ready to learn. 73% uh, feel that we have those, and I'm happy that we have those. 
Uh, we have a, an adjustment counselor in place that works hard uh, to make sure that the students that need adjustment uh, have that adjustment. And we also have a, a psychologist and guidance department that works hard with those kids. Is your overall sense, and I hate to use the word, but I guess I'm going to use it, that, that a, a significant percentage of parents are essentially abdicating their role as parents once they get to high school? And if that's too strong a word, feel free to correct me. I think what you, you have a percentage of parents, um, and, and I think it's fairly small, that didn't have a great high school experience. Um, so maybe there's a little intimidation there in regards to the high school. Um, I think, as Dr. Rabinovich said, you know, maybe it's, uh, they've, they've kind of become frustrated with their, their child and their education. Um, I, I feel that if you have an involved parent, um, you've got a student who's on his or her game in the classroom. Um, and that, you know, I, I think uh, that's the key. And that's part of our communication piece is trying to get the parents more involved. Uh, we're, we're, we've started uh, high school uh, PTA to get parents involved and so there's some things we're trying to do to get the parents involved it's 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 kind of frustrating because at the time where students are making decisions that are probably going to affect them the most in their life the parents have kind of given them their space which the kids are crying for as you know with teenagers and uh, the reality is that's the point in time when they need to pull pull the reins in and, and really help guide them through uh, these decisions that they're making that are going to have a drastic effect on their future uh, we have a tremendous problem with freshman failure rate that I'll get into in a little while. And the guidance counselors are very concerned because decisions they're making as freshmen are affecting their GPA, which in three years when they smart, you know, hopefully they smart up before three years, but when they start to get on that right track, the GPA is at a point where it's going to limit their opportunities. So um, certainly one of our goals is going to be to make sure we have that good communication. We have a plan to start uh, with a freshman to get a contract with the parents. Uh, to try and uh, get these uh, the parents on board and involved in uh, will being uh, signing this contract, in, which is going to require them to attend meetings uh, with guidance counselors, with teachers, to really try and get involved. And uh, I think it's our job, if these parents do feel disenfranchised or, or in intimidated by the high school, to try and figure out a way. And I, met, I heard Joan mention feed them and they'll come. That's something that we, we need to look at, to get people in there, to get people involved. Uh, tomorrow night we have an uh, academic awards night. Um, but those probably aren't, to stereotype those parents, those probably aren't the parents that we need to get involved in this communication. It's the parents that didn't have a student invited to that awards night that we need to get involved. Mr. Chair? Yes. It's not something that just happened over the summertime, that they were, um, you know, in eighth grade, they were still engaged in making right choices and things like that. They had a summer. Um, and then all of a sudden they come to high school and now they all of a sudden they've dropped off. And I don't think from a, from a parent perspective that's probably there either. Is there, have you talked to Principal Gilmore? Is there collaboration or communication between the two of you? Is there something going on in that eighth grade year also that's, that's then transferring over to high school? We, we've had several conversations and actually we're, we're getting together uh, for lunch next week to have, continue our conversation uh, on that transition. Um, it's, it's hard to say. I just think that uh, it's a different structure in high school and there's different requirements and um, maybe there's a little more freedom um, in regards to it's not that house system. Uh, certainly something that we've looked at uh, is possibly creating a freshman academy at some point in time so we can really um, keep kind of keep our, our thumbs on these kids when they're transitioning into that high school experience. So there's a um, there's a few things we're looking at that I can tell you there's good communication between uh, Mr. Gomo and myself, um, but we're, it's, it's, we're still working it out, trying to figure out exactly what's going on and why we're having the, the issues that we're having with the freshmen. The good news is that um, usually by sophomore year, they start picking it up and, and, uh, and owning it, but my concern is how detrimental has that freshman year been because of the decisions that, that the students have made. I got to I'm sorry. Uh, and just playing catch up is always difficult. So if we can have safety nets or something in place. To exactly. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got, I, I received a presentation from a very large high school in a Chicago suburb. They have something called, of course it's an acronym, ILPs, Individual Learning Plans. 
and every and this happened to be a high school district and every student was required to show up with their parents some time before they started their high school experience and talk about where they were, where they wanted to go, how they wanted to get there, and most importantly, what they were going to have to do to get where they wanted to go. And sometimes the parents were somewhat shocked to hear that their students were not ready for certain high school courses that they should have been ready for, et cetera. I love the idea. Um, is that feasible organizationally to do in Wareham? You know, we, we have a, a program that's very successful uh, in our special ed department, um, which is core academics, which basically is very similar uh, to what you described. My, my hope is that advisory can be that venue um, where those conversations are happening. Uh, it, as far as meetings. But advisory is student teacher. It's right, not as parent. far as meetings with parents, something we're going to have to look at. Um, I can tell you that uh, there are very few afternoons right now, uh, which is good, that we don't have at least uh, two meetings going on in the high school for parents. And that also brings in eight teachers for each uh, student. So there's, uh, there are meetings that are occurring. Uh, a lot of them, uh, a percentage of them are, are IEP meetings. But there are meetings that are occurring. But I think it's something we have to look at uh, because I, I do believe, again, that's another way of getting the parents on board, getting them involved. And it's a nice segue for me to give them the power school information. This is all the information you need on power school. You know, and we try and dovetail every meeting into, are you able to get on power school? Are you able to check with your students' progress? And if not, make sure we give them the handout. We have a nice little printout that gives the, uh, the directions on what they would need to do to log in how they can go in and check the progress, all the features of Power School, because there are quite a few features. Um, you know, you can sign up for emails, things of that nature. Um, so it's, it's uh, I think it's in depth, but uh, certainly it's something we need to look at. It's interesting because I know the elementary schools have a process where they literally sit down one-on-one -on -one with a future kindergartner to essentially interview them without their parents there, but their parents are sort of lurking in the back watching their very young child interact with a teacher for the first time. That's their introduction to essentially school. If we continued that process, okay, you've made it through elementary school, now let's talk about middle school, then you've made it through middle school, now let's talk. It, it would seem to me that as healthy as that process appeared to be for a future kindergartner, we shouldn't stop it. That every child deserves that individual learning plan and every parent needs to be involved in it. And now I'm starting to sound like an educator, and that's a mistake, but <laughs> it just seems intuitively a good idea, especially given there's dissatisfaction with the communication with, uh, with parents. And of course, we have a, t you know, I don't know, a 20% dropout rate or, or, or whatever. So 20%? Any, well, I know, it depends on how you calculate it. We, we have an average dropout rate. What, what in your mind is the, is the Less than 2% in my mind. Then we're talking about two different numbers. And Are you talking about the four-year graduation rate? Yes. Okay. Sorry, that's, that's what I meant, the four-year okay. graduation That's rate. what I thought you meant. Yes, sorry. And what is that <laughs> number from your perspective? 80, 80, 80. Low 80s? Yeah, I was going to say 82 is what I was okay. going to say. Yeah, 18%. Okay. Yes, we were talking two, okay. different, two different numbers. Thank you for correcting me. Okay, you got me nervous there. No, no, no. Okay, so anything we can do to improve that graduation rate, it seems to me there are some people who think that that graduation rate is impacted by what goes on in elementary school. But it certainly could be enhanced if we improve communication, but I've said enough. Go ahead. Thank you. Okay, so I'm, uh, I'd like to first uh, update you on the last year's plan, and um, I'm, I'm going to I'll try and go fast here, but uh, and obviously I'll be glad to answer any questions. The, the goal number one um, was on student achievement, and uh, basically uh, we were offering a science course that was our MCAS tested course, the Intro to the Physical World. It's a freshman year course. For the most part, uh, honors freshmen uh, take biology, but I would say 80% of the kids are involved in this course. In the past, it was taught by every teacher in the department taught one class. What we did this year was, with the help from Jan and the curriculum office and Anna, uh, we were able to purchase textbooks, which we did not have textbooks for this class. So we were able to do that over the summer. We 
follow the district policy, had a committee, we reviewed, I think, four books, Jan? Four books and uh, went through the merits of all four of them. Uh, ironically, they came up with a unanimous decision in regards to which book to use. Uh, Jan, I don't know how she did it, but she negotiated free internet access uh, from the publishing company, which usually there's a charge for that. And uh, so that was great. That gave a lot of supplementation as well for the teacher, or teachers, excuse me. We established two teachers to teach this versus the six that we had uh, before. What we did as well is we relocated these two teachers' classes so they could be next to each other and also right next door to the department head. Uh, the only thing that we are going to continue to work on, and I know I spoke with Jan on this, and this is, uh, I would say, largely because of uh, NEASC, and because of the new evaluation system, we couldn't come up with the five professional days, and it was more just that we didn't have the professional days. It wasn't that. It was a, a funding issue. Uh, it was just uh, logistically with NEASC, with the follow-up to NEASC and with the evaluation, we ran out of days. So obviously that's something we're going to look to do for this year, is to provide that professional development, and, uh, and, and, and actually we're going to have a new teacher in there as well. So we'll be uh, providing professional development to get that person up to speed as well. So uh, that's uh, what happened, and again, the only thing that didn't take place was the, uh, the PD for the teachers. Okay, Are we good yes. with that? Yeah, well, sorry, Scott. Just so you know, I think that um, I remember when we first started going through the goals and, and the relocate classroom, I think I said something then, and I'll just basically say it now, it makes me mental that we have a goal that is to re relocate a class and then we relocate it. To me, that is th this goal is about, and so just in preparing for it next year, the goal is around student achievement. So I would want to know that one of the things that we did. So the goal is basically that we're that we've um, increased, like we did um, for science MCAS scores, improved by five percent. You know what I mean? That what what did that do? Just moving a classroom is just okay. it's something that we do to be able to get there. So okay. just, just so you know, when we're talking about goals, it's sure. Our, our next goal, um, what we found in, in uh, as you know, we spend time in either August or early September with uh, looking at MCAS scores, and, and obviously we spend more time than that over the summer. We spend a lot of time, time trying to diagnose MCAS scores and, and predict some scores. And, and now with the INFORM, I think this is going to be even easier for us. Uh, but we found that, and we didn't have this in place uh, for the previous few years, is that the students that were um, struggling in 10th grade uh, in the MCAS were very easy to identify who those kids were going to be. Uh, there were very few surprises every once in a while. You might have a surprise with someone who's dealing with some outside of school issues, but there were no surprises. So we wanted to, uh, back a few years ago we had created core math classes. Unfortunately, uh, they had gone by the wayside with the budget. One thing that we wanted to do when we changed uh, the schedule and teachers picked up an extra period was to create uh, some core math classes. Uh, I felt that by giving those students the foundation in ninth grade, in 10th grade, and basically what it uh, constituted was the students uh, in the core math class would have math every single day versus every other day. And we did the same thing in English uh, for ninth and 10th graders. And uh, although I, I can't say, I, I say that the classes were set up, I'm saying that the uh, results were pending and you know I, I'll be here in the fall to uh, give you an update as I always do on the MCAS, SAT and AP testing. So I'll uh, ask you to stay tuned as far as the results on that. Uh, but I think they'll be positive. Uh, obviously we doubled the amount of time they're spending on that specific content area. Okay. Uh, one of the driving factors for, for our new schedule was the uh, alignment with the Mass Core, which uh, was a requirement. Uh, we came up with the new block schedule, which had four periods each day. We spent a lot of time, and I definitely want to thank uh, Dr. Binovich and the WEA uh, for working on that. It, it helped out our students uh, immensely. We were able to offer uh, some elective courses. We were able to offer uh, more courses, get rid of study halls. Uh, not sure where that's going to be this year, but uh, this next year rather, but this year was very successful. It was great that the kids were very involved. They were able to take electives. So I, I, when I met with my, uh, my roundtable group, which is uh, we, we just select 15 kids um, and the computer spits out 15 names, there were kids that were very excited about classes that they weren't that excited about when they started this, uh, th this journey in September. And they were very appreciative of the fact that 
they were forced to take uh, a sociology class or maybe an art class. So uh, we did increase our course offerings, we did increase um, our electives and we were able to get the new schedule in place and the teachers teach six periods in the rotation uh, versus the five that they taught before. And uh, we also, a piece to this alignment with the Mass Corps uh, was to increase the School to Career offerings, which we were able to do and uh, as I mentioned previously, increase the elective offerings. And uh, the, the evaluations in School to Career were very positive. Uh, we, tr we tried to, we did an interest inventory in the School to Career and we tried to match the students up with uh, areas that they would be interested in. And uh, we had some, uh, some great locations, some great help with the community and uh, locations that we couldn't have because uh, before the classes had to be, the uh, locations had to be available for a 7.40 a.m. drop off uh, or thereabouts depending on the bus route. And uh, now the start time of 11.21, every professional business is open at that point in time during the week. So we were able to, we had uh, more opportunities uh, and hopefully as we move forward, we'll continue to have uh, more opportunities for our students to have uh, a professional experience. <coughs> so that is the, uh, the alignment with the Mass Corps. Mr. Palagina? Yes. Mary Sure. Talked about this when the cooperative came in and um, talked about school choice or, you know, after work. Um, and there was concern that the after school placement or, you know, that leaving school early to then go to a placement um, that there, you know, wasn't really being met. If students lose their job or, um, you know, or do they come back into school or? We only had uh, one student, maybe two, it might have been the same, it was one location and it wasn't because of the student, it was a confidentiality issue and we were able to relocate uh, them in a, in a similar setting. It, I'm not going to say every year that, that we're as, as good as we were this year. It was a really good group of kids. There are times where the match isn't working out one way or another, um, but we have uh, a teacher that is assigned to check on the students. We have uh, great communication with the locations. We have paperwork that's filled out, evaluations that are done, timesheets, uh, and then there's always reflection that goes on as well. So uh, it wasn't an issue this year. I'm going to knock on wood, but I know it has been an issue in the past, and we've had to deal with it, reassign. Sometimes, matter of fact, in time, uh, sometimes it happens kind of at that midway point, and we reassign the student to a couple of classes. But there is a right. starting point, and there is an sure ending point where right. they come back. They come back in to the school at the end of the day. It's not like we're sending them to work and we don't see them again. They leave at 1120, and they're back at 205, mm -hmm. and they ch there's a check-in at both times, and there's check-ins at the locations where they're working as well. But there is a plan that if someone where you just, that they've been laid off economy, whatever it is, and you can't find another placement, that there is a, um, you, you bring them back in and assign them classes. We've done that in the past, um, but usually, the, the, Places are, places, places are pretty much knocking it I just want to make sure that there is an alternative if it's not just. Sure, and locations are, are very happy to have a student come in and, and gain some experience in their, in their venue. Yeah, thanks. Okay, uh, as we, I think we mentioned when we were looking at the AP scores, uh, I guess it would have been about two years ago, um, we had realized as we started to dissect the scores and, and why they were low, uh, that some of the people that were teaching AP hadn't been to professional development and some that had, it was 10 years ago, and obviously the test has changed. And so uh, what we did uh, through the help from the curriculum office um, and the superintendent's office, we provided uh, opportunities for all AP teachers uh, to attend the Summer Institute. And uh, everyone but two uh, went to the training, and uh, this is on their time. We paid for the course, but they gave up a week in their summer. And I think I may have mentioned this in the fall when I did my AP presentation. Um, and the two that couldn't make it, uh, one had major surgery and one, his wife had uh, major medical issues, but everyone else went. Um, they all came back excited to teach the course. They were excited with the, to have the new supplementation, uh, new ideas. Um, so it was, it was a great week that was spent and, and we had people go, um, one gentleman went to Albany, one went to Vermont, but most of them were uh, in Fitchburg here in uh, Massachusetts. And the reason they were at those locations is because they were there for the, with their family. It, was, it wasn't that we were paying for them to drive out to Albany and stay at a mm -hmm. hotel or anything like that. It was, uh, it was all because of the family and uh, commitments they had with their family in those areas. 
That was my question. Don't worry. I was going to challenge you on that one. <laughs> okay. Um, we talked a lot about AP scores last year. Right. So are you anticipating that we're going to see a significant increase in those scores based on this training? I believe we'll see increases. I'd, uh, I'd want to know your definition of significant. <laughs> that was left off. <laughs> we will see increases, I am sure of that. Um, and we were, we were really hoping uh, to get involved with Mass Insight. We spent a lot of time, Dr. Vinovich, uh, Jan, uh, Debbie Freitas, and myself, and uh, we spent a lot of time. Every time we turned in an RFP, there was another RFP, <laughs> And uh, we had site visits, and uh, allegedly we were the last one cut. So we'll be looking at that again next year. I'm really hoping that uh, we can put some pressure on them to allow us to join them. And what basically, just to give you a brief uh, description of the program, is they provide um, curriculum, they provide training, they provide um, uh, coaching. coaching to come in. And uh, what they also provide is, is basically a social network for AP teachers to talk about their craft and to discuss different ideas, what's working, what's not working. And it's just a, it's a great program. Unfortunately, they only have a certain amount of money, but we're hoping to uh, get on board with them again next year. At least now, I think we're confident in the process. Uh, we just need to make sure we can get, uh, be one of the top uh, eight <coughs> schools. And monetary incentives for increased participation in AP, as well as increased scores um, on the AP test. Cool. Did they give you any indication, either through you or through Jan, uh, on why we were not selected, given the fact that I think we've got a full range AP program? Uh, and certainly, um, we could certainly use the uh, tutelage. So, and they uh, did, said, yes. Did they give you any indication as to why we were not selected? Um, they told me to call our local politicians and encourage them to. Uh, Try and find some funding. Um, so I, I think it's um, you know well, somebody must have been funded. There was, there was uh, I believe there were uh, nine schools that were funded. I believe we were number ten. Um, and part of this is there is a state does fund part of this, and I guess they didn't fund as much as they were hoping for. Obviously with the so tough Mass times. Insight is a private organization. Yes, it is. Okay. Scott, did you were you finished? No, but go, go. ahead and then I'll do my thing. No, you might ask the same question as me. Go ahead. I never like anomalies. I look at math SGPs, and they're, in, with the exception of our wondrous fifth grade class, which hopefully is going to continue to get better and better and better, um, the math scores are not particularly good. In fact, they get, they, they hit about 34. Um, in eighth grade, this was 2011 results, 34 in eighth grade, and the English results are 38.5 in eighth grade. What's anomalous is the fact that two years later, the math continues to go down. In fact, it hits its nadir at 30.5 for 10th grade math, but drum roll, the English results skyrocket to let's call it high 50s, low 60s, one year was even up to 70. To me, that's an anomaly. Can you explain that anomaly for me? I Good English teachers. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Thanks, Cliff. Um, I think Math is tough for our students. Um, I, I will say, do I have, can I explain it? Um, I'd rather not on camera, but I will tell you <laughs> that um, we are making changes. Um, and I, I believe we're heading in the right direction. We're still in the infancy of these changes. Uh, but we know what the problem is, and certainly I'd, I'd be willing to have a private conversation with you on that. But we know what the problem is. Uh, we have staff that are working very hard. Uh, we're hoping this override passes so we can get books in those classrooms. Uh, we're working hard on, uh, over the summer, um, tying in with the National Common Core in regards to the uh, curriculum. So that there are some positive things that are going on. I don't think this has been an issue over one year. This has been an ongoing issue. But I do believe um, that we are addressing the issue. And I'm sure when we have that conversation, you'll be confident that that is being addressed. And. Um, they were, the teachers in the math department have been working extremely hard this year. 
I think we'll see some incremental uh, increases in the MCAS scores this year, but I really think next year is going to be a big year for us. I really think we're going to, we've got some ideas, we've got some plans, and I hope that the override passes and we can get some books in these classrooms because just so we're clear, there are classes that have one classroom set of books, okay? And, and when you look at the classes that have books for every student, they're so old, they're falling apart. I, I don't want the positive to, to be left out of what I said, though. You have proven with the English department that really good things can be done. Every student scored above a 220 last year in the uh, 10th grade MCAS. So, and that's uh, in the eyes of the state, that's needs improvement or better. Right. Which so those kind of results in the English department are great. And unfortunately, you've proven it can be done. And so we I, I don't see that as unfortunate. Well, my point is that means we, your school committee, or at least this one school committee members, expects it in every department. <laughs> yes, Cliff. I, I think that one of the one of the things, and I, correct me if I'm wrong, Scott, but I can make an assumption on this too. Is what, what I think in English that we've uh, we were really on the cutting edge and in infancy and in bringing alternative assessments in and using the portfolio in the English department. Now we've got the portfolio going school wide, uh, and now all of the core curriculum areas are participating in the portfolio process, and that in itself I think is going to uh, do a lot for uh, increasing your uh, st uh, student performance, uh, uh, student growth uh, uh, percentages. So I think that um, I, I think that having that portfolio school wide through all through all the core areas uh, will be a way I think in which kids can focus in. Um, with more of a fine-tooth comb uh, in the other core areas. That's just my gut, um, just from my assessment background. I, I think the portfolio helps. I think the, the big pieces this year, um, we've had uh, common prep time, and the department has gotten together, specifically the department uh, ninth grade, tenth grade, in regards to the MCAS, and they have really spent a lot of time looking at the curriculum, uh, picking out areas that they really need to uh, to spend time on, and I think the other piece is, as I mentioned before, the core math class, we've identified students that have deficiencies, and uh, we've placed them in small, smaller classes uh, with a certified math teacher who works with these uh, students on their deficiencies to hopefully bring them up so they're no longer deficiencies. So I think there's, there's probably about four or five uh, initiatives, if you will, that we have uh, uh, taken on board this year, and I, I think we're going to see some positive results. It's going to take time. These results didn't get to this point in time in a year. Um, but I do believe that uh, when I'm in front of you in the, in the fall, we will see uh, some positive steps, and uh, I think with another year under our belt, it'll continue to move forward. Thank you. Unfortunately, with uh, everything going on, there was uh, the community service requirement that uh, we're going to keep on board for this year for school improvement. Uh, it just never was able to, uh, to come to fruition. Obviously, you understand there was a lot going on with NEASC and, uh, and the new schedule. And uh, so, unfortunately, this uh, didn't formalize. But I am happy to say uh, that we did have two uh, people from uh, the high school that did attend a one-day seminar on uh, community service uh, requirements and capstone projects. And uh, hopefully, we'll have that in place for next year. So that will remain on as a uh, school improvement goal for next year. We had some uh, issues with the physical plan I mentioned last year, and um, I feel if they have a positive classroom environment, um, they're going to they're uh, stay focused and be able to learn. And when it's very hot in the classroom, it's a tough environment to stay focused, especially at this point in time of the year. Uh, so we were able to uh, fix all the windows. Uh, we replaced the existing carpet. The only room left is the auditorium, the band room, um, and a little section of the portables. Uh, uh, but I, we were able now, and this has been a process over about seven years. If you remember, if you were in the high school seven years ago, the whole high school was all carpet. And uh, we were able to pull that all up over seven years. And uh, so we are just about will be done after this, this summer. So I'm very excited about that. And uh, the windows, especially uh, with MCAS testing, it's, uh, it's great that we can actually open those up and get some fresh air flowing in these classrooms. If you have a window. <laughs> if you have a window. I don't have a window. <laughs> Scott, I don't remember the last, I don't know when you were last in room 119. I was there today 
for a required CPR first aid course, you may want to walk in there sometime and take a look up. Yes, uh, we got the uh, the bid on that, and I'm going to have to wait until after. Uh, I just got the bill, the uh, quote rather. We're going to have to wait till after July 1st to get that fixed. Another, I know you're surprised, but it actually, believe it or not, it ties into the roof. <laughs> oh my goodness! And then it, it comes right down the side into that classroom. But uh, we do have, a, we we think we can get that actually fixed. Uh, Great. Thank after you. July 1st. Okay. Um, I, I know you, I'm sure you've heard it from all the principals and you'll continue to hear it. You know, we, one of our goals last year, and it will remain a goal this year, even though we did meet it for this goal, is to improve the technology. Um, right now, just so we're clear, we do not have a, a general lab um, that can be utilized uh, by all of our teachers. There are some rooms that have computers in them, some work, some don't, but there's actually, there's not a room to go into and bring your whole class down there and utilize a computer lab. So. Uh, we have been uh, replacing, we replaced 50 computers. Um, we have made sure that when we, when I, call, when I say replace, it's not reassign an old computer. It's actually this computer is old. We're replacing it and putting that in the obsolete. And then Anna has the fields and grounds. They uh, go through a process where it's obsolete and, and do what they need to do. And then eventually it's uh, recycled. Uh, so we were able to do that. Uh, part of that, just so we're clear, was through the NIAS process because their requirement for technology was so great, uh, and obviously we didn't have the technology they needed. Uh, that was how we were able to do that. Uh, we also were able to uh, get some donations from the military. Computers for them that are three years old are obsolete. Computers to me that are three years old are, are brand new, and it brings down my average uh, age of computers. So we were able to do that with some help from the JROTC. They have some connections. We are able to get us some computers that way as well. We were hoping to mount uh, LCD projectors in the classrooms. I feel if uh, you can make the, te uh, the technology um, hard-mounted, hard-wire it, uh, it's going to last longer. And uh, our goal uh, was to have 15 of these. Unfortunately, we, we didn't have the money for 15. We did purchase, um, I believe, a half dozen. And our goal is, uh, again, for this year is to get 15 of those mounted, hard-wired. Uh, it requires bringing an electrician to put power up on the, um, on the drop ceiling. And uh, we're going to continue to hopefully get that done over the summer. That's one of our goals that we'll have to stay on. Okay, any questions on, on last year's plan? Okay, moving on. A as I mentioned, uh, based on, and, and this is uh, just picking up on the paperwork that you received, based on some of the surveys and the staff, we have a problem, and I don't think it's unique to us this year, uh, with the freshmen. Um, a lot of it has to do with um, classwork and homework and uh, as, as you know um, there's a direct relationship with that classwork and homework and the assessment scores. So we want to create an intervention program for all incoming freshmen. Uh, our goal is to find a way, whether it's through grants, um, f uh, st Wayham Public School, Wayham High School funding, is to post and hire an intervention coordinator who will work for four hours a week uh, with the students, we're going to require that the parents sign off on um, paperwork, requiring the freshmen stay after two days a week with the teachers. They'll be tracked. Um, there will be a meeting that they'll have beforehand where they sign on, and then there'll be quarterly meetings to update, similar to what Mr. Sweat said about having meetings. This will be just with freshmen that are pre-identified based on their first month's schoolwork. Uh, we're really hoping to, to catch these kids early. And, and to give them that foundation so that they're not in a position, as I mentioned before, where uh, freshman year, um, you know, their GPA is very low, they have to go to summer school. Some of the students, you know, uh, Mr. Sweat mentioned the 82 percent uh, four-year graduation rate, and now, um, you know, we're, we're hoping to improve that by kicking off um, this, this intervention program. Any questions on the intervention program? Good luck with it. Sounds great. I hope we can afford it. Mm -hmm. We're going to try and find a way with it through grants or creative funding, whatever we can do. I think this is, this Sorry, is Mike, very well, important. Well, that, that's what I was going to ask. Is, is that included in the current budget? It's not, but where there's a will, there's a way. We're going to figure it out. I really believe this is one of the important pieces to improving our school is getting these freshmen on board. And obviously, there's, there's the payout will be the next three years. These students will hopefully have the skills. They're focused. They have the study skills. Uh, 
parents are involved. Um, this is just another, hopefully another tool for us to get these kids on board and, uh, and get them in a position so when they're seniors, uh, they're able to get into the schools that they want because there were some seniors this year that couldn't get in because of the GPA to the schools that they really wanted to attend. And, and these are kids, these kids I'm talking about really picked it up the last two to three years. Mm. But because of decisions they made when they were 14 years of age, mm. it, it affected them. So what do you mean the decisions that they make? Are they talking, are you talking socially, academically? Probably a little bit of both, probably more academically. I don't think it's as much a social issue as you would think. It's, it's more just, um, I, I think it's a study skill issue to be mm -hmm. quite honest. Um, organization is part of it. Um, Maturity certainly is part of it, uh, but hopefully with some some guidance from the parents, from this intervention interventionist, and uh, and from the teachers now because they're going to be seeing these kids at, staying after for them. Remember, the teachers are after every Tuesday and Thursday as part of our contract. They're after for almost 40 minutes, and uh, it, a lot of students do take advantage of it, but not enough. One of the things, if I can, one of the things that they do in college is that for the freshmen, for the incoming freshmen. Uh, you have the option, another way to get money out of parents, to um, have them go there the week before and actually do a, a study skills um, workshop. Um, they do it for a week or three days or something like that, but it's teaching them basics um, like how to keep a schedule, how to study on your own, um, how to keep notes, you know, just all the, the kind of tools that you need to be able to do it. Have we thought about um, the summer, you know, before these freshmen that are coming in, um, being able to get a volunteer or someone to donate their time or something to be able to do that kind of workshop for our incoming freshmen that are coming in. Well, we've done, we'll, we'll be doing an orientation next Tuesday. I know that's, you know, there's two months in between that and the time they actually walk through the doors. Um, I'd love, there's a lot of things I'd love to do, but they require funding. I mean, my teachers donate and volunteer hundreds of hours a year. We'll see it tomorrow night. Most of the staff will be there. Most of the staff was there on, on Friday at graduation. Um, it's very difficult to ask them to give up five days in their summer for no additional compensation. No, and I'm not even talking about the teachers. I'm talking about if we can get um, a company to be able to come in and volunteer their time that has this kind of background um, that we wouldn't have to, we would only be talking about building costs, that it could be done right beforehand where you have a volunteer um, group coming in to then providing that kind of service and no teachers would be necessary. I would, I would I mean, the building, it's open anyway, so it's not going to cost us anything. If there's a company out there that you're aware of or anyone's aware of, I'd love to be emailed or called on that because I think that'd be great. And uh, I think um, if we were able to push that during, during our orientation and uh, through our global connects and uh, communicate that to the parents, I think uh, you'd be surprised how many parents would be willing to have their students go for a few days beforehand. I think that we'd have a, a good crowd of, uh, of incoming freshmen there. Thank you. Thank you. Mike? Uh, you mentioned uh, the teacher staying for 40 minutes uh, after, after on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Correct. What, what is the focus of that time? F the goal is to be available for extra help. Um, what happens, as I mentioned, there are multiple meetings going on, so some of the times the teachers are involved in parent meetings, but I would say 80% of the time the teachers are there for extra help, and it's a uh, it's great. There are so many schools that don't have that. We are very lucky to have that. And, uh, you know, it's 40 solid minutes that the kids can get in there. And I'd say the average uh, student-to-teacher ratio at that point in time is three to four students for one teacher. So it's a great opportunity. It's free. We provide late buses on those days. And uh, some of the kids do take advantage of it, but not enough. No, no it, does, it does sound great. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Curriculum re revision, a as you're aware, the Common Core is in place and we need to revise some curriculum. Uh, we had a great department meeting. Jan came down, uh, I think it was about a week and a half ago, and uh, refreshed the department heads on the Rubicon Atlas program, which is a great program uh, for mapping the curriculum, uh, helping to write the curriculum. And uh, I'm excited about the fact that on June 22nd, uh, department heads ha have an opportunity, and most of them, I believe, are going to take advantage of that. Uh, to go through uh, some training. Um, department heads are creating a proposal for summer curriculum work within their department uh, with a few teachers, and uh, that is going to be happening in the next few weeks. And so there'll be work in the summer that's going on, uh, and they'll also be using the district-approved template, which was something that NEASC was uh, really adamant about, obviously. 
and that's something that we have in place and that the Rubicon Atlas is going to um, be very helpful for our staff as well. And uh, I know some of the elementary schools have already really embraced the Rubicon Atlas and I know it eventually <coughs> the high school will do that as well uh, next year. Scott, <coughs> when do you expect to appoint the department heads? We are, um, we will have that in place by the, uh, sometime in June. Right now they're, they're technically vacant, correct? Technically. But, the, well, they're, they're contracted until uh, July 1st. Oh, so I they're, see. They're so still this in is, place. This is post July 1st. Right. I'm sorry. We'll, we will have it all taken care of. Uh, I would expect to have that by the end of June. Dr. Minovich is going to be getting an email from me with some needs that I have, and then uh, we'll have to uh, probably do some impact bargaining on that. But we'll have that in place. Okay. Again, the summer curriculum work, and, and that's kind of why we have to have it in place because there's going to be work over the summer. So once July 1st, it's, uh, we, we really need to have that in place. And uh, the staff will be trained in late August. We'll look to use one of those uh, in-service uh, days to spend some time uh, with the staff to make sure they're updated uh, on where the curriculum stands. Obviously, the, the expectation is we're moving forward with the curriculum. I don't think the expectation is going to be that everything is tied up and, and done uh, in August. I think that's unrealistic. Uh, we will, in the fall, train the staff on the Rubicon Atlas. Hopefully this will be done by department heads, uh, again, cost effective, uh, whether it be through department meetings um, or whether it's done through early release. Uh, that's yet to be determined. Um, but we're hoping that, uh, that that can happen early so that the staff can use it throughout the year. Um, and as I mentioned, the curriculum work will be continued through uh, in-service, uh, early release, uh, with full staff participation. And then hopefully we'll have that completed. Uh, the goal is by the end of the year, we'll see how that goes. Okay. Um, one of the areas specifically in the Mass Tell and, and obviously in the NEASC um, is, and, and I'm really excited about this because uh, we've already done this a couple of times uh, this year, and uh, comments uh, in the evaluation where uh, this was some of the best professional development we had, and a lot of it was done in-house at no cost. Um, so we want to provide the faculty-driven uh, process to select some of the professional development. Obviously, we have to be realistic. We can't select all of it. There's some that are district initiatives that have to take place. Um, but the staff was just excited to have two this year. And uh, with NEASC and with the roll-off in NEASC and dissecting the NEASC report, that was pretty good for us. And uh, again, working in conjunction with the curriculum director and uh, department heads to develop the uh, professional development and you know we're going to look at this hopefully a year from now when we look at the staff surveys we can get that improved in regards to professional development up to 75 percent and I do feel that uh, the, the reason why people were kind of burnt out if you will with the early release in the in-service was just that whole NEAS process and I hate, I hate to keep going there but it was pretty intensive and it took some time to get to where we are today so uh, we're excited about that. We're excited the fact that we have opportunities for professional development and that they're not already tied up in, in uh, NEASC preparation. As we saw in the survey, um, parental communication was an issue. Um, I think certainly um, our plan with freshmen is going to be helpful, but I think it's important for us. Uh, one of I'll, I think our deficiencies is our website. Um, we want to, and, and that's more on the high school's part, not on the district's part. We need to use that website. Uh, I had a chance to look at the middle school's web, what they do, and, and we need to kind of join forces with what they're doing uh, in regards to announcements, messages. We want to try and utilize every opportunity to communicate with parents. And, and you know, I think we, before we mentioned, well, let's, you know, we'll email the surveys. That's just another option for us. So now we're looking at how can we communicate to parents. We're going to website. We've got the message board now that's, that's working properly that we've been putting messages on for almost a month now. Power School actually has a message alert that we're going to utilize. Uh, this is when parents log in, there's a, a message that comes up automatically for the parent. Uh, so that's just another way um, uh, to communicate. Although we use Global Connect, uh, usually it's twice a month, we're going to increase that and, uh, and hopefully uh, get some results there. Um, in-house in, in regards to communication uh, with the students, because this is parental communication, but also we want to look at some uh, student communication. We are going to, uh, instead of what we do now, is we do about a six-minute uh, student-run television show. And what we want to try and do with, uh, we've been working 
uh, with Wareham Community Television, and Christian knows about this, and uh, we're going to create a one-day-a-week show uh, that's used during a, a viewed during advisory that's going to have all kinds of information for students. And then to get that to parents, Christian's going to run that and loop that uh, through WCTV so the parents can see it as well. So we're very excited about that. We've been working hard with Wareham Community Television, and uh, we've gone, as I think I mentioned before, we've gone on some field trips to other schools, and we're really getting, we're getting some good ideas from what other schools are doing, and we're incorporating that into our curriculum. Uh, the hope is, with the staffing, is to get the journalism class involved and do some video journalism, journalism classes that are going to um, involve the students that are in the journalism club and uh, we're going to get them to compete at, uh, they have some competitions uh, in regards to, I believe they call it the uh, Mass Emmys. And uh, so we're excited about that and we're excited about the fact that we've joined really, we've had some great collaboration with WCTV. They've come through with uh, cameras, uh, they've come through with uh, instruction and our goal is to have uh, Christian work with all of our staff uh, in, in any type of uh, video uh, venue that's needed by our staff. Continue just, on with communication a, and, and... Excuse me, Scott. Yes. Just, just a quick note. Sure. Uh, I love the message board, but it's actually more up to date than the website for the calendar. So anything that can be done to improve the, uh, the content of the uh, website would be great. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the message board. We Sometimes we get a call if it's a day old. Uh, <laughs> The website, we don't get those kind of calls, but I do know that's an issue, and that's something, again, it's on the improvement Scholarship plan. night, for example, wasn't on the website. All right. So, we'll work, yeah, we definitely, that's something we need to work on, and, we, and uh, I know that's an issue. The, uh, we're hoping uh, through, uh, hopefully the senior class can help us out. Um, we're looking for two areas, and this is one area, is uh, an LED message board placed in the cafeteria with important messages. We try not to disrupt the classes during the day with messages, um, you know, especially in the spring, and I know Mr. Lorange was in here a few minutes ago. There are cancellations, there are changes, and we felt this would be a venue where we don't have to make that major announcement that the girls' tennis match has been canceled, practices in the gym. Now we can put it up there, we can have someone assigned to do that, and we're not disrupting the class at 2.09 when the, the teacher's at that last point and they're maybe giving them uh, their homework for the night and all of a sudden we come on and boom, here's your, uh, afternoon announcements. So we're really hoping to be able to utilize that. Most of the decisions that are made happen around 11 o'clock, which coincides with our first lunch. So we're hoping to have that LED message board in there. And also we'll have general announcements that aren't as time sensitive as cancellations and reschedules. Um, we started something in June, so I, I kind of jumped on this. Uh, again, trying to make sure that um, the staff, we have good communication, everyone has a lot on their plate, and we started these Friday emails, which basically talk about, and actually I guess we started that in late May, uh, basically it, it tells everyone what's going on the following week. There are so many things going on at a high school, as, as, as many of you know, and uh, it's important that everyone knows exactly what's going on because sometimes you may see someone once a week in the school as far as the teachers, seeing one teacher down here, another teacher on the other end, uh, and there may be something going on that's very positive in their classroom that they could go see after school. So by emailing the Friday notes, everyone knows what's going on and there's good communication because in a school with 62.5 teachers, you don't see everyone every day, and everyone gets a ton of emails. And so we try to make sure if we send an email, it's very important. We don't want teachers to be getting 10 emails from administration a day. We try to minimize that as, as much as possible. Obviously, you knew this was going to be on here, the NEAS concerns. We do have to address those. Um, one is that we want to uh, have a committee um, and uh, the committee would be a two-year follow-up committee, and we want to get that posted hopefully within the next few weeks uh, to have people come in over the summer and address those concerns. As you're aware, we do have to address uh, the concerns uh, in October of 2013. We have to have a percentage of the uh, concerns addressed. We want to conduct those meetings. Um, and, and what we want to look at, and this could f fall back and be an issue, but obviously I think we have to look at the areas that we mentioned before that have minimal to no impact uh, on the budget at this point in time. But at some point in time, we're going to have to address those issues. Uh, but I'm hoping that the percentage that we need to take care of uh, can be taken care of uh, with a minimal cost. We're going to look at the highlighted areas specifically and try and address those. And I know we did a presentation and, and we gave the key of the, uh, the green and the yellow areas as areas we're going to really try and work on. Some we've already done, happy to report that. but. Uh, We've got a lot of work to do over the summer. 
hopefully the last part I don't have to do. That's the sub substantive change. Um, I'm really hoping that, that uh, we can delete that and it doesn't have to be uh, filled out, and that is for a, a change in staffing. So that's, uh, that's the NEAS piece. Any questions on that? Okay, um, the last piece is the technology. Um, we want to uh, purchase new computers uh, in a, this is going to be in our room 113. Um, and if you, uh, if you heard um, the, at graduation, uh, the senior class has made a decision that if there, whatever money is left over once they pay their bills and they're going to have to wait a while to make sure all the bills are in, uh, they're going to help us out with this in room 113. Um, late August, maybe a little bit early, but we're hoping really to have that in place for the students when they come in in September. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to relocate the computers that are in there that are working into two classrooms. One is room 128, which is a business classroom. One is room 130. Uh, one is the library, and uh, hopefully increase the technology in there. So we'll take the good computers and relocate those computers in there. So we're excited. We're going to have um, printers in there, uh, hopefully new monitors, keyboards, and obviously the new computers. So it's going to be uh, hopefully a great room for teachers to sign out and utilize with their classes. Something that, with the technology that was in there, um, it didn't get utilized because it was hit or miss whether it was working or not. So uh, unfortunately, a, a small percentage of teachers would even sign up for that because you create this great lesson plan and then you can't use it in the classroom. That's it. Mike? I'm good for now. Yeah, Rhonda? The only same thing that, um the smart goal they had for that was update the only general computer lab in Wareham High School for all teachers to use. The only thing that I didn't see in you know the measures that I'd like to see for that one, I mean I asked my questions all throughout, but just that you know how you're going to increase the student use of computers. I think that's really what the goal is for that. I mean, yeah, we're going to be moving things around and stuff like that, but you're trying to give um, greater access to our students when it comes to technology, and so I think that should be kind of put in. Right, that so what, what I'll do on the follow-up on that, that's a great point, is um, I have the printout of how many teachers utilized it this year, and what I can do is a year from now compare that to the number of times it was used per period, and uh, I think uh, you'll be very happy with that number. Okay, great. The only other thing is it's just a general question of, of how, besides the NEAX goal that you have, how much did the um, results from NEASC influence um, this school improvement plan for this year? I, I think it greatly influenced it. I think that uh, across almost, the board for all of the goals. Right. I, I, looking back, I think every area was an area of concern for NEASC or a recommendation, as they put it. Okay. Um, there continues to be, I think, a lot of confusion on what um, we we are accredited. We are accredited. Absolutely. And we need to, we need we need to, to stay focused that on that. We keep over and over and over again that right. we are accredited. Right. Um, but I think that there's still a lot of confusion out in the community about what it actually means of where we are and what it means if we do continue to uh, um, not focus on improvements that need to be made. Um, so I would just encourage, you know, as we go along that we continue to not just let me ask go away, but, you know, we're continuing to communicate about about what that accreditation means. I, I, I just think it's important because you know, some of the things that I am hearing from the community is that um, middle school parents are basically saying, well, I'm not going to send my kid to a school if they're all of a sudden going to be in a position of not being accredited because that's going to affect their college. So there's, there's, I think, concern out there that and decisions might be made because they're thinking that the accreditation absolutely very, very important, but that um, what it means for their student long term, and they're making choices a lot earlier um, because of, of the announcement. So I think we need to get more information out there about it, okay? I, I agree, and you know, uh, you don't want to say this, the sky is falling. Um, there are a lot of schools that are in the same boat as us. Um, and then again, as you mentioned, we do have accreditation. We've got some work to do, and we're going to need some help with the resources because there are a lot of things, as, as you all saw from my presentation before, there are a lot of things that we can't fix unless we have money. Um, we can push that off, uh, kick the can down the road, but eventually we're going we're gonna to have to deal with it. I'm hoping that we can deal with a little bit each year so that in four years, all of a sudden, everything that has a, uh, cost 
a lot of money is going to be uh, have to be dealt with. I hope that's not the case. I hope there's something that we can do and, and try and earmark a percentage each year with the help from the town. And I think the override is a is a good step, a good first start. And uh, we can we can address a lot of those issues. The textbook issues, the technology issues, could be addressed this year. And I think that's a that's a nice piece to take care of right off the bat. So. Trying, we we're definitely trying to stay positive. The staff did a great job, uh, as you all saw with this. There was a two and a half years worth of work, um, and uh, it, we we are staying positive. And uh, uh, we know that you know we saw Dr. Minovich and I went to a top five dinner, and he was trying to figure out what I was doing, but I was keeping score. Our kids are going to the same schools or better than all of the schools in the area. So our, our top kids are, are getting a phenomenal education. Um, despite some concerns that we have uh, inside the building, but uh, we're working hard, the staff's working hard, the students are working hard, and, uh, and we're moving forward. The last comment that I'll make just has to do with capital improvements in general, whether it comes to technology or, or um, the school building. Um, I just I think maybe we should have a discussion here on whether that needs to continue to stay at the school level or because we have so many capital needs of our system is that do we need to be able to pull that at a district level and make that part of the superintendent goals instead of you know just so again we, we need a capital plan for all of the schools I, I just it pains me to see every single school talking about basic needs of fixing a roof or so it, it comes out of the strategic plan because that is one of the goals of the strategic plan. Therefore, it tra translates to the school improvement plan. Yeah. When do we get to attack that strategic plan again? In a year. Thank you. Cliff. Just, just a couple of comments in general, um, and uh, if I um, um, if I say some things that uh, uh, you don't agree with, please stop me and say you're full of baloney. Um, but you, you, you can get a lot of mileage out of advisory. And uh, my perception now in talking to parents and students is that we're not getting a lot of mileage out of advisory. Um, we should be doing a lot better on advisory. And, and in terms of dealing with freshman orientation, freshman attitudes, freshman culture, uh, fresh, freshman readiness to learn, uh, freshman becoming part of the school community, uh, an awful lot of that. Uh, could be uh, directed through advisory if we had a targeted, a targeted goal. Uh, let, let's say what, what our target is going to be the ninth grade. Well, you target on the ninth grade, and you target those ninth grade advisory teachers uh, about what, what, and it would, you know, what they should be doing in order to advance uh, the uh, goals and and the uh, academic uh, academic goals for our ninth graders. So. Uh, Again, not to belabor the point, but I, I don't think we're utilizing, this is just my opinion, of course, but this is based on what I hear. We're not using, we're not utilizing advisory to the capacity that we could, because it really does give us uh, a direct link to the kids uh, in a different venue from just the classroom. Uh, can I, can I comment on that? Sure. I, I totally agree with you. Um, it was funny because uh, when we're starting to reflect now about this year, I think we took a huge step forward last year with advisory. And it's fair to say we didn't take as big a step this year. Uh, it's funny you should bring that up because tomorrow I'm emailing Jan and we're trying to get the committee back together over the summer to really make sure that when the teachers come in, the students come in, there's an understanding of what the curriculum is. Um, due to no one's fault, uh, we weren't able to have that set up uh, over the summer this past year. Uh, but I agree with your assessment on advisory and I also agree it's a great venue um, to dovetail with what we're trying to do with the freshmen. I don't think it's going to solve the, the problem that we have with freshmen, but I think it can work hand in hand uh, with our initiative. <coughs> right. Another thing, too, is, and I, and I don't know, um, there's all kinds of problems with this, but, and I'm not saying that what we did down in Sandwich is, is the best, but we did have an extensive freshman orientation program over three days. We brought the freshmen in. The freshmen go to school 183 days. They got brought in three days early. And there was a YMCA camp down there, I forgot the name of it, but there was a lot of uh, outdoor uh, rope climbing, wall climbing. Um, and um, the, tr the counselors were still on duty uh, in August and September. Camp Burgess, I believe. That's what it is, Camp Burgess. And we utilized that and for part of the program. The other part of the program was that over those three nights, you know, we had a, a skeleton crew at the school, and every single solitary freshman had to come with their parents, sign off on a contract before they even got a locker. 
They wouldn't even get a locker assigned if we didn't have a sign off from the parents. So there are all kinds of little creative things that you can do in terms of establishing, establishing the atmosphere early on to the freshmen that, hey, this is no longer fun and games, this is serious, and this, this is what we expect from you. Uh, and there is a, a, you know, there's a whole idea of, of togetherness and coming together because down in Sandwich we had, a, we had a little bit of a more of a problem than you do here because our freshman class was coming from three schools. Sure. So we had three K to eights. But anyways, there are some things to do it. There are some, some really creative ways to get the freshmen to meld into, in, into a class. Um, in terms of the, uh, the other thing about, I, I'm focusing on the freshmen because that kind of bothers me, is the whole idea of going to the deans, where the, the deans, that freshman dean would be in a position to work hand in hand with the guidance counselors in coming up with creative curriculum in terms of socializing, uh, the freshman class and also directing them academically uh, to what their expectations are, the, the you know, homework, the portfolio, whatever the case may be. So I think that as the dean system progresses, uh, there is going to be, because the deans are still by class, is that correct? Correct. Well, you know, there are going to be those activities uh, that are germane to the freshman class, the sophomore class, AKA MCAS. Sure. Um, so I think every dean is going to have their a uh, little niche of the school culture that they can zero in on, and certainly they should be working hand in hand with the guidance department. So I think that's another that's another element of capacity that we can tap into that we probably uh, have not been doing. So I think that uh, you know there are some creative ways that we can uh, zero in on on the freshmen. Uh, we could we could have a, a, a freshman day uh, because if every if every staff person in that school. Every professional staff person in that school, you know, uh, counseled 25 kids, 25 freshmen. You, you could counsel every single solitary freshman uh, if you wanted to on maybe a, a PD uh, day. PD is another thing I wanted to talk about, is PD for teachers. Again, you can be creative on this. And uh, I think that the best professional development you can have is infused professional development internally. And I, I strongly suggest that you take one of those schools impro school improvement goals, right? Take one of them and, and concentrate on that one goal as this is what we're going to do in PD this year and nothing else. This is going to be the focus of our PD. Um, because having, you know, having a smorgasbord of PD is all well and good. But if it's not focused, um, it's what it is. It's a smorgasbord. And you're not going to get that much out of it. So I think that. Um, you're on the white. You're on the right track. I think you've identified. Uh, you've been very intuitive in terms of identifying what the problems are and possible solutions. Uh, I admire some of the creative solutions you've come up with. And if there's anything I can do to help, please don't hesitate. Def definitely interested in finding out. Uh, you know how that program was funded down at Sandwich. If we can, uh, at some point in time, communicate via email. Yep. I think that's outstanding. No, I call me. I will. I, I <laughs> That's right. I'm sorry. I forgot. <laughs> we, we did bring a group of students down there, so I know the facility you're talking about, and uh, it would be a great venue. I know it was very pricey when I brought the kids down there, so I'm looking forward to that conversation. Yep. Thank you. I think we're all set, Scott. Thank you very much. Thank, right, you, thank Scott. you, Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thank Mr. You LaRanger. Appreciate it. Come on down. <laughs> Bye, my <laughs> Thank you, folks. It's the village PTA. Thank you very much. Yes, it's the village PTA. That's right. You ready, brother? I am seeing. You need a pop one going? Before we get started, if I if I could, I just want to thank Mark for a great first year. We had, uh, I think, we had a tremendous year and. In the field of athletics, and uh, he's done a great job with the phys ed and health staff. So I, I want to just publicly thank you for a great first year, and I, I definitely look forward to the second year and look forward to the future. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Could thank be a mock chair you, back there. It was Christian. <laughs> that, was, that was not a mock chair. It was a sincere chair. I also want to. I, I. One second, please. No, I was just going to say, Mr. Chair, uh, that Scott. It, Less than a year, and he's got hockey on the on the agenda tonight. 
Less than a year. I thought that you were going to be a little bit more tough. You know, wrestling. you know. You know I mean, wrestling, wrestling. not I was going to say, where? I was gonna say, Sorry about that. She had Rest, the wrong sport. I, I knew did. what she meant. Well, when you showed me that I could make some money, I, I, I was willing to listen. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. I also want to thank Scott and, and everybody in Wareham for, for my first year here. It's, you know, really it was a difficult year, to be honest with you, because I, I learned a lot. I, I didn't, you know, this is the first time I've ever been an athletic director, and I, I coached three sports, and I kid with my wife and say, you know, time-wise, it's not that much difference because when you're the head coach of three sports, you're always out coaching and doing things. So being an athletic director, the time is not, not the issue at all, but you couldn't do the things that we want to do without the support of the administration and, and, and Scott and what he's done. And I just, you know, as you look at the budget and things that he's fighting with to go through, it's, it's amazing what is able to get done in that school with what kind of funding and things that he has. And, and it's, uh, you know, it makes me happy to go to work every day knowing that there's so many people working hard to get things done, you know. And, and I think every, every proposal I've came to Scott and, and Debbie with about, you know, a captain's lunch and things like that, it's all been welcomed. It's all, nothing's been held back. If it made sense, they've welcomed it. So we've been able to provide some things for the kids here in Wayham. I think they're a little bit special. And, and that's what we're trying to do, just try to, give a little uh, back to some of the athletes and all the time they put in for our school and do, do some special things for them. So, so it was a fun year, it was an interesting year, and I, I'm definitely looking forward to next year, without a doubt looking forward to next year. My, my spring athletic report, the budget, um, the numbers are there. We ran uh, total expenses of $85,203.64, and those Supplies include annual bills, transportation, salaries, so on and so forth. Uh, users' fees revenue was ten thousand nine hundred and fifty um, total users' fees throughout the seven sports that we had. Which report are you looking at? We have three. Spring. spring. The okay, spring the, annual report. The, the spring with transportation or the spring report total sheet. The spring total sheet. Thank you. Yeah, the fancy cover one. I don't know if you got that fancy cover. I didn't get a fancy you didn't cover get it? one. <laughs> Shucks. All right, and then <laughs> I'm reading through the athletic report this? This, in right? the first page. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Mark. I didn't give you the fancy cover. Feel free to highlight. You don't need to read. Okay. Some of the things that we continue to do with the community service projects with our with our programs and every single program that we had throughout the year. Uh, completed a, a community service of some sort for the town of Wareham, and you can read what they're doing there. Track teams doing the Relay for Life, softball volunteered at opening day. One of my goals for next year is, and it's kind of a community service type of thing, one of my goals for next year is to every program to have some kind of youth night. We call it a youth night or a youth day or where we invite anyone that's interested, any, any age kid in Wayham that's interested in a particular sport that we have a youth night. Basketball, it's very hand in hand because a ton of kids playing basketball in the community. Uh, softball, baseball, and we invite them there. And basketball, we might play a game at halftime for a few minutes. Or um, baseball, we might allow to go out there and, and hit ground balls to each other. Something to bring them on there because I think when you're a kid, and you get to go on the floor or you get to go on the field or on the courts of where you're potentially going to be going to high school, it burns. It makes you want to be there. It makes you want to be part of it. So we're going to ask each program next year to have some kind of youth night that we're going to bring kids into our, into our facilities and kind of show it off a little bit. If you went to the tournament game today, the, the, our facility, our baseball facility is incredible. And I could hear the Middleborough people saying, oh my <coughs> God, it must be a joy to play on this field. And I thought, wow, how about a fifth, sixth grader playing on that field? How excited they would be. They would, they would think every day about coming to Wayham and playing baseball for that, for that school. So, so we're going to, on those lines, try to get in there. Uh, congratulations to our baseball team, finishing 14 and 6 and uh, going to the state tournament, hosting two home games, which is a lot of fun. We again listed our, uh, some of our superlative things that happened in the spring. Aaliyah Alley broke the uh, school record in the 200 meters and tied it in the 100 meters, qualified for the states in three different events. Uh, Caitlin Berger, Emily Cummins also qualified for states. And our four by one relay team in Madison St. Julian, Aaliyah Alley, Nicole Johnson, and Stephanie Borges qualified as a team. 
boys track, Johnny Irvin, Evan Moretti qualified for states. Our color guard uh, team uh, won the state title second year in a row. And uh, in girls softball, I thought this was a nice thing to put down. We added a freshman program in girls softball, which is really nice. Anytime you can add more athletes to your team where you can field three teams, particularly with a school with less than 800 kids in it, I think that's doing a really good job. And we, we we didn't add a team. We didn't have a freshman baseball team. The freshman baseball team that we had the funding for then went to the freshman softball yeah. team. That's great anticipation. I know. You're going to ask for how it was paid. <laughs> uh, both our tennis teams were SCC Team Sportsmanship Award winners, which was a nice touch. Congratulations, Jeff. Throughout the fall, winter, and spring seasons, um, we increased by uh, over 15% of our athletes. Uh, that's that finished the teams. We our cut rate or quit rate uh, on our teams this 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 year was outstanding. I mean, I came from a different school. I saw it in different schools, and not once kids signed up to play a sport, the majority of them stayed. Which, in my eyes, is coaches doing a good job because if kids want to be there, uh, they're doing a good job. So that was very impressive. Um, and then some of the new programs instituted, I, I, you know, this is things that we've done throughout the year, meet the coaches night. I've already gone over that uh, in my previous meetings. Um, we did hold a senior athletic awards night we, with a catered dinner that I thought went very well. And, and any senior athlete that had played a sport this year, we had dinner for them, and then we went to the auditorium and gave out awards. I uh, once proud again, the South Coast Conference All-Stars Honorable Mentions and Sportsmanship Award winners are listed below in, in the spring in softball, Tara G. Tommaso. I have a tough time with that name. If you went to the banquet, I think I had to say that name 30 times. She did so many good things. Volleyball, Quentin Silverio is an all-star. Baseball, Sean Conway, Billy Peterson, Ian Searles. Girls track, Ali Ali and Caitlin Berger. And in girls tennis, Rachel Bonfiglio. Honorable mentions in softball, Brianna Muir, Stacey Krojic. Volleyball, Tim Regan, Marcel Merritt. Baseball, Brandon Heal. Girls track, Emily Cummings, Paige Feskins. Boys track, Johnny Irvin, Evan Moretti. And in girls tennis, Carly Briggs. And then our sportsmanship award winners. Each, each program has one sportsmanship winners, and they are listed there as follows. Spring sports captains I listed. I think that's important to show leadership. There's a ton of two, three sport captains at William High School, so I listed them as, and you know, again, I think if kids are staying on teams, coaches are doing a good job, and so aren't captains and leaders because the young kids are feeling comfortable in the locker rooms. And that's one thing we talk about at our captain's breakfast is that we want our freshmen taken care of. We don't want the freshmen walking in there. They're nervous enough. We want leadership where the older kids are taking them under their wing, welcoming them to the program and taking good care of them. And, and I'm a big proponent of telling our coaches that don't have your freshmen taken out the water. Don't have your, have your older kids doing that. They have your older kids lead by example of taking out waters and cleaning locker rooms up and things like that. It's not a freshman job, it's, it's a leadership job. So, And then at the end of the year, we all met uh, as coaches and, and with myself to work on some goals and, and development programs and things like that. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Mark, uh, <coughs> we, as you all know, we increased the uh, requirement to participate in regards to the number of classes uh, students had to pass. Can you touch on how many kids were academically inel ineligible for spring sports? None. Yeah, we had we had, didn't have not one throughout our signups. What we had sign up for spring sports. When I did the grade okay. checks, we did not have one athlete that was academic. I should have put that in the report. That's good. That was not academically ineligible, which is outstanding. Not one. So every kid had passed six classes or better and could play the sport they signed up for. So that's, that's definitely of, moving in the right direction. I'm pretty confident you knew the answer to that when you asked it. No. Stumped me for a minute. Ball yeah. there to use he stumped me. Analogy. <laughs> I was very excited about that, as you can tell. Yeah, that was awesome. We increased the requirement by two more classes, and to have that, I couldn't believe it when I said go back and double check it. He triple checked it just to make sure, and there was not one student athlete uh, that had to be removed from the team for eligibility. So we obviously you raise the bar, and the kids will meet it. You have to understand the MIAA. Is absolutely believes there's data to support that playing a sport increases absolutely. academic performance. Absolutely, without a doubt. Because in, in when our kids, we I, I am tracking it right now. Some of our winter kids that did not go out for a spring sport, their grades went downhill big time according to what they had done 
while, while they were with a coach playing a sport, their grades were higher than when they were not. Because when a kid's busy, they'll do their work more so than when a kid's not busy. They go home and, and, and they don't do anything. They, and with, they're with a coach and doing grade checks, their academics are, are better. So that's, that's the biggest thing about playing sports and being part of something that, that you, you stay focused. And that, that's the key. So you're absolutely right, I think Joe. it's routines and time management. Yep, yep. Our athletic report by uh, numbers is there. Um, I won't read it all through to you, but that's what we spent on, on, on salaries and things that we did throughout the program. Uh, no gate re receipts because we do not have any gate for spring sports, and our users' fees are there, and our totals are down the bottom. If you turn the page, it's broken down by sport. One of the things I want to clearly state that, of course, it's going to take time and developing programs and things like that, but some of the records and things of the teams. I, I know winning isn't everything, but if you play me in checkers and I lose, I'm going to play you again and again and again and again until I beat you. So it's bothersome to me that, you know, we have some programs that, that you know, we're in, the, we're in last place in the SEC in a lot of programs. And, and, and mark my words, it's going to be different in the next few years. Things are going to get better. It's just it's going to take time, but things are going to get better. And when I met with my <coughs> coaches, every one of them is in agreement on how, what type of the, some of the things we need to do to get better as a program. And, and our coaches are working hard, and, and, I, and I think we're going to head in the right direction. It's just going to take time. Baseball had an excellent year, wins-loss record-wise, uh, and um, the other programs, you know, it, it's going to take time to develop programs is all I'm going to say, and, 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 and we will develop programs there, uh, wins and losses. Our expense piece there is by sport, and you can see that, you know, some sports are more expensive to run than others. All in all, the spring is the least expensive sport to run, uh, the least expensive season to run throughout the, uh, throughout the three seasons. Most expensive being fall because of uh, there's an extra sport. Oh, well, actually, winter is pretty tough, too, with, with hockey. Any questions? Probably a million, right? Mike? Uh, no, not yet, thank you. Not yet? <laughs> Would you like me to come back to you? Yes, please. Okay. Cliff? Yeah. Glad to see that girls softball was the second leading yes. sport. Yes. <laughs> Cliff, it's, you're going to see they're all going to have winning records in three or four um, years. Well, they didn't have a winning record. Mm. Well, they... they um, no, I, I think that the report is, is, is very good. It's very complimentary. I, I think you've highlighted uh, some of your accomplishments. Uh, I had the pleasure of going to the um, uh, awards uh, night, and uh, I thought of all of the things, uh, in my opinion, um, that you've brought to, uh, to Wayham. That was one of the best. Um, I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Uh, the kids seemed to have a good time. You know, it was nice to have it catered, and then um, it was really good. The uh, the slideshow that went along with every kid that was awesome. Uh, they gave it a nice personal touch. Uh, job well done. That was uh, very very impressive. So uh, I really enjoyed that. That was that was fun to go to. Thank you. And that was catered by cost for um, the breakfast nook down there on, uh, is it Cranberry Highway, Scott? On Cranberry Highway donated that food for whatever it cost them is what we paid, which is outstanding. So, you know, I can't thank them enough for that. They were, uh, you know, the, I, I told the kids during the banquet that if, you know, if you're gonna go out for breakfast, go and support them because they, they stepped up big and they served the food and gave us the whole night, you know, and, and the preparation before that. So, you know, it was a really nice thing by. No, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Mike? Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you. I, um, I was just double checking something to make sure that my copy didn't get cut off, but I see there's a column for Team GPA and there's nothing listed. Yeah, the, the GPAs aren't finished until the end of um, the school, school year, so I couldn't tally it together. The semester two grades aren't, aren't technically over until school gets over. So, okay, so, yeah. so it'll be updated at then? Yes, right. yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I think we've said this uh, a couple times in your reports, but it would be great whenever we're um, able to see um, spring or fall or whatever the results are in the end of the year, being able to see the year over year, being able to see the difference from last year to this year. So if we can just 
make a note for you know for the the future ones that it definitely includes at least last year I'd love it to be able to go back a couple of years but even if it's last year comparing last year to this year in each one of the categories in each one of the reports I think that would be hugely beneficial <coughs> not only to us but also to you as we start charting the progress of, yep. of what you're making and, and within my second year now that I have all the records for last year my records it that'll be definitely on the report for the fall because gotcha. it, it's all right in front of me now so great it, it was t it's tough to look back sometimes and go back in our programs and and actually my computer is gone so I lost a lot of my computer died so I lost a lot of my um, last year's results and things like that that Tina had saved the computer is gone so uh, some of it's on my thumb drive but a lot of it is not and, Scott and just got three-year-old computers he wouldn't give you one well, they, <laughs> they would disperse before he had the water leak in his uh, in his office so that's a whole nother issue I won't go there <laughs> yeah. but it all it all fell, unfortunately. Insurance it, claim. Yeah, it was just his office. <laughs> the deductible is too high for yeah. one office. All right. Thank you. Um, the other um, question that I had was, um, I think it's great that you implemented a, a you know, meet with the coaches at the end to talk about um, raising academic GPAs. Um, did you think to include either the deans or um, you know, basically from the, the academic side that's responsible for the academic side in the school, being able to um, add them to that meeting. So then basically it's a joint meeting between the coaches and also the deans talking collectively about what can be done to increase those scores. Um, the last thing that I'll say is that, you know, the enthusiasm and passion and the dedication that you have, we are very, very lucky to have you in the school system. So I'm impressed first and foremost by that, but even more importantly than that, and in this first year, the results that you are, you've already been able to show. So, you know, just keep up your dedication to this district, and then, you know, I absolutely see, like you're saying, that the results are only going to increase year after year. So thank you for, thank you. Watching for your first thank year. You. I am uh, very lucky that I get to work with Mark more than anybody other more than any other uh, committee member, um, but I uh, can agree with my colleagues that uh, we're lucky to have you and you've done, had a great first year and I enjoy working you, with you both as a committee member and as a coach. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's all you have to say? <laughs> I, that's <laughs> I'm so, this is the first time that he hasn't right. talked about per student or per Let's move class. on. Let's move it on. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the truth is I calculated those things and I didn't think they were worthy of note because <laughs> I know Mark has other initiatives nice and, job. and I trust him to be working on them. Mark, go ahead. Go to the uh, waivers? Yes. Okay. We have, we applied again for eighth grade waivers. There, there are two goals in applying for eighth grade waivers. One is developmental programs you get an extra year of of a of, of an athlete participating in your program the second thing is to increase the numbers so we applied with seven for seven now we got denied one but i went i went back and <laughs> and like i said when i <laughs> he wrestled them and won <laughs> <laughs> they said when they said no to me for girls tennis i guess they said they have never had somebody just sit there and stare at them <laughs> after they had denied me i just sat there and i just stored them like this <laughs> and they said that they knew they were going to hear from me. They goes, we, you, when you shut the door, he said, this guy's not done. So he went back and ended up getting the, the waiver. But the, um, the eighth grade waivers uh, that have been approved by the MIAA through District D is boys and girls cross country. That's uh, today's seventh graders that are income and eighth graders for next year can run cross country. Uh, we have um, field hockey got approved and golf got approved. So we're excited about it. And in the winter, I already have my ideas of where we're going to go from there. We're not going, uh, we're not applying for waivers for, for teams or, or programs that have good numbers and or have good feeder systems. A, a sport like tennis, a sport like golf, a sport like, they don't have youth programs. So track, we went and, had, and got away before. There's no youth program for those those particular teams and we don't have a middle school program for them so to try to build numbers and develop programs we got approved through those four and, and we're here to see if um, the school committee would accept those four programs as um, eighth grade waivers so that was cross-country boys and girls cross-country golf and field hockey okay 
I'll take a motion. I move we approve. Second? Second. Any discussion? Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Four zero zero. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. And the last uh, bit of business is, is we we are partnershiping with uh, Carver, and, and Carver has very low wrestling numbers, and we are projecting lower hockey numbers due to our graduation rate. The hockey team has graduated 11 and 9 the year before or something like that in the past two years of seniors. And that's not a sport that you can just go in the hallway and find a kid to play hockey. They've got to be playing when they're younger and skating. And, and our, our sixth, seventh grade group is very high in numbers, but we're very concerned on a lull with hockey. So we, we are partnershiping or proposing that we partnership with Wareham, Wareham Carver, to co-op in, in boys hockey and uh, add a program, which is you know warm to my heart, is, is adding wrestling. Scott's gonna start kicking me under the table here, but in wrestling, what we did is I put the proposal in how we're gonna do it. It's, it's better than cost neutral. Scott had said to me that if you wanna get wrestling in Wareham, it can't, it, it's gotta be cost neutral. It cannot cost money. So what we did, we worked out with Carver. I met with the Carver athletic director and if uh, you approve the co-op between Carver, Wayham, Wrestling, Carver pays for all the buses for the wrestling team, including practice shuttles. We are gonna practice probably three days at Wayham, one day at Carver. When we practice at Carver, Carver would pay for the shuttles uh, for the Wayham students back uh, to, to, to Wayham, I mean to Carver for practice. Uh, Wayham keeps the user's fee, so if we have 30 kids go out for wrestling uh, at Wareham, we keep the user's fees. The user's fees goes into the Wareham uh, athletic account uh, and Carver wrestlers as well. The Carver <laughs> donates the mats, which is about a $10,000 value. Carver has... Did you, did you wrestle the Carver AD for this? No, he wants to keep his program. <laughs> he, he really does. Like, he, like, Everything you said sounded like you must have, you know... <laughs> <laughs> He's actually a Plymouth guy. But <laughs> Go ahead. We... Uh, they're gonna donate, not donate, let us use a mat. Uh, they have two mats, so they're gonna bring a mat which we can also use for cheerleading. Uh, when, they, when they toss, I mean, I sometimes cringe at seeing the girls get thrown up and then we get this little blue mat underneath them. This is gonna be a, a, a thick wrestling mat that the cheerleaders can use as well. They're gonna let us uh, keep that on our campus, the cover mat, until we can gain money to, to, um, to buy our own and Wareham keeps all the money that is earned for wrestling quads and duels. So if you have a wrestling quad at your, at your school, that's four teams that come in, and we set up a, some kind of snack bar of some sort, not gonna charge admission, but some kind of snack bar, and, and, and Carver, I mean, uh, Wareham keeps all that proceeds as well, too. So we're figuring it could be as much as, you know, $4,000 that we could add to our, to our budget and start a new sport at Wareham, which is, is a perfect world, perfect world. Carver, Carver hires the coaches too. I'm just trying to understand, how does the competition work? Because it's obviously not uh, an SCC program, correct? Yep. It's, there's, a, there's a league out there now that's combined with uh, Middleboroughs in it. There's about nine schools. It's, it's a division three South wrestling league and there's about nine schools we're going to enter that league the sandwich it's called the Bayshore, i believe the no not the Bay Shore, the, what, excuse me the sandwich in that league nope they sandwiches in the atlantic coast league so they, they have wrestling yes yeah and they're all cooperative what's that they're all cooperative no this is the only cooperative us and one other team and i i don't know it's a it's a cape so if a match occurs the winner is wareham carver yes wareham carver Yep. And what we're going to do to save money for the first year is we'll wear Carver uniforms with a Wareham <coughs> type of emblem on them. And in hockey, we'll wear the Wareham uniforms with a Carver emblem on them. And, and how does the MIAA connect with this? Do they? Do they? Well, they have to prove it, but. Do they recognize the results? Yes. So how is it different? than us having our own team. Well, the, the main thing, the main reason why we wanted to co op with Carver is because it's, it's not gonna cost us a dime, we're gonna gain money from it. And where we're struggling, uh, I, there was, it would probably cost us about 
I think I got it value down to eleven thousand dollars to start a program. That's 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 not to start it. That's a program that's in that's in that's on its feet. To start a program with mats and things, you're looking at about twenty five thousand dollars. Do it, are there any wrestling programs in the SCC? DR just started one. Dighton okay. Rehoboth just started one. Are they going to? Are we competing with them? Yes. I haven't done our schedule yet. I haven't looked at any of it yet, but. But that will be the one league, the one, that, they're not in that league that we're trying to get into, but that, that will be the one team that in the South Coast Conference has wrestling. So wrestling, generally speaking, is somewhat embryonic, um, certainly in the South. South. South Coast does not have it, that's correct. South of Plymouth, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> South, <laughs> really, and you know, I, I, my friends were laughing when I said, so I was, you know, wanting to go to Wayham and be an athletic, and they said, no one wrestles in the entire conference. You're going to go nuts. Okay, tell us about hockey now. Hockey is um, hockey estimated costs is twenty four thousand to, to to run hockey. Carver has uh, seven hockey players, I believe, Sorry. around seven hockey players. They were co opted with Sacred with Sacred Heart, and that dropped. Sacred Heart dropped, so now those kids aren't playing anywhere. So we were going to co opt the hockey and bring those uh, Carver kids into Wareham and let, let them play hockey with us. It's kind of like a good friendship type deal. And the you know, financial impact of that decision? The financial impact is um, Carver, Carver uh, Wayham keeps using fees for, for, for wrestling and, and, and Wayham hockey, but the Carver, the Carver is going to fund, uh, we're going to fund the hockey and Carver keeps their hockey players uses fees. That's the only difference. But it's already in our budget, so we're, we're going to, we're going to still fund it. Whoever signs up to play hockey for, for Carver through the co-op, they get to keep their users' fees. So they can buy tapes and tape and some of the supplies they might need to get through the year. Still sounds like, from a Wareham perspective, the cost per participant is going to be exceedingly high. For hockey? Yes. Yes. Hockey will always be exceedingly high. Ice time, rentals, is nothing you can do about it. I, it's always going to be a high-cost high, high cost sport. Well, there is one thing we can do about it, but I'm not going to talk about it at this point. Yeah, we, <laughs> I know you thought, but no, no. Okay. So, I mean, we can add a program, strengthen maybe another program, and, you know, and, 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 and get, you know, I, I, I personally, I mean, I, you know, I, if a kid's in Carver and, and wants to play hockey and there's a way for them to play hockey, then... Then, then that's awesome. You know, I, I mean, I, I don't care where you live. If you, I mean, I, I think it would be a really good thing. I think that the best of both worlds for, for both schools. Questions? Mr. Chair, before we take questions, we need to go uh, make a motion to go past the hour and 10 be to finish the agenda. Yes, I'll take that as a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, I, I think it will be not far past because we only really have a small number of administrative things to tackle after this. Um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Four zero zero. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Yes. <coughs> is, it, is this the Question. sort of thing that's going to have to be, you know, re-voted on every year or? Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah it's, a, it's, a, it's an every year, every year um, ap application applied in the MIA for so let's say we run it, and that's a good question, actually, and we end up having 50 kids come out for Wayham to wrestle, then it probably will not be approved the following year. It probably, they, they will say Wayham has to split and become, you know, maybe at that point we can help Carver get their numbers up, too, so they don't drop their program. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Cliff? So this is the winter season? Yes. So... Uh, we already have hockey. We're going to run hockey, but your 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 conclusion is that we're not going to have uh, as many kids out for hockey as we've had in the past. Is that yes? Do you know that for a fact? Have we had signups already, or is this just a educated guess? It's an educated guess, but hockey is one of the sports you can educate. You you can take an educated guess on according to who's coming up from the eighth grade to play as freshmen and who you lost right. and. And there'd be no uh, financial commitment for salaries or anything like that, right? Nothing. Okay. Um. Well, hockey, it's in our budget. For yeah, hockey, budget, yeah, but right. not for wrestling. Right. Um, here's my only problem with the whole thing. Um, is timing. 
and I know how badly you want to get a wrestling program here. Um, but perception is reality. And we just laid off 21 teachers. We've cut programs. We've got class size of, at the elementary level, hovering four to 30 kids. And now we're going to add a sport. Adding a sport and four thousand dollars into the into the budget too, like we're adding we're adding we're offering another sport for Wareham students and we're gaining money from it, and a mat that's worth you know ten thousand that they're going to donate. I mean that's he doesn't quit, does he? right. <laughs> well, you can say it's supplementing some of the other sports. I, I, I understand the concern and. Those are my concerns as well, and I said, don't go. You're not going in front of the school committee unless you can show them something in the positive as far as revenue. And and, and I not, think, but this is again, a, this it's about perceptions of reality. I know yeah, we've I got understand. real good press here, and yeah, I know the I press understand. is fear that's here. Yeah. But the, the perception is reality. I mean, we're, we're cutting programs, we're looking for overrides, we're, we're pleading poverty, and we're going to add a program. Yeah, and four thousand dollars. But in, in, a, in a time in a time when, when we're, com we're we're competing with other schools, to be able to offer another program at no cost and there's a, the positive outcome, uh, it, there's a lot of competition at the secondary level to keep kids in town, and this is just another way for us to have something positive going on. Okay, I'm done. Rhonda, we, did we talk to the um, hockey students that are going to definitely be hockey players next year? About the co-op? Yes. No. No, I, if I had brief, has it been rumbling around the school a little bit, a little bit, and if a kid asked me about it, yeah, I see it's a possibility. But yeah. I have not I have pulled them in until it's been approved, and then we then we go from there. What are you hearing back? I mean, generally positive, or basically, I don't want to have to share our program with another town. I want to be able to be Wareham Pride and and be a Wareham hockey team. I have heard no negative. I haven't heard, I would say, you know, it's kind of like, really? I, I haven't heard any negative about it, about the Wayham hockey players saying. I think if, if it gets to the point where possibly we couldn't feel the team, then they would certainly, whatever it takes to keep it going. And if that's bringing right. Wayham kids in, there's extra seven to ten kids. Well, I think they got seven definites, but maybe they have a few eighth graders coming up. I'm not sure about that. So let's say they bring ten athletes onto our team, then that, that's good because we keep our program, maybe play a little JV games and some of those kids that wouldn't play a lot because we don't have a JV program right now can possibly get on the ice more. Well, I mean, there's, there's two issues that I have and I understand, I mean, being able to get a sport in here and get some extra money into the district, that's a win-win. The concern that I have has to do with, uh, you know, that if we were in a situation where the hockey team um, was on the chopping block, which yes, sports in general, and we have a lot of hard decisions that we have to make. But you know, but we haven't talked specifically about hockey being on the chopping block. Um, so one concern is is that you know, again, the the reason why we're doing it is because to be able to gain another sport. And I know that's not the only reason, but I mean that that's kind of like what we're talking about here. The second one is that we have seven kids, and you know, hopefully seven good kids coming over from Harvard, but. Is that going to prevent a uh, quality Wareham um, kid from playing hockey? I mean, I know we don't have 30 kids, but you know what I mean? Like, I just, I would, I would hate to all of a sudden have a, a Carver kid take the place of, a, of that, a Wareham that, student that would like to play hockey here. That's, that's a good question, but it, there's a no cut policy. We will not cut athletes. Uh, any, anyone that comes up with hockey, we'll, we'll find a place for them to play. We, we, right now, we only have a varsity program, so. Right. So, you know, we, if we get a lot of athletes that come out, then we'll create a junior varsity program, and the kids that are on the varsity don't play a lot will be able to play a ton at the JV level. So it's a win-win for them, too. Right. But it, going back to that, I'll use Cliff's perception as reality, that um, if there's a perception from where her parents that Carver kids are playing over theirs, you know what I mean? These are kids that have been on the program for a while and things like that. I think we just need to think about that a little bit if we're going to basically combine the program, that we have to think about the kids and the parents that have basically been invested in hockey and, and dreamed of playing for Wareham hockey, you know, since they were in the Wareham youth program. That is gaining momentum also. The youth, the youth program for Wareham um, is gaining momentum with the grants that they got to be able to go to Tabor and bring in all new kids. My, my son is five, so sorry, he's not going to play hockey yet, but, you know, he got he involved in that. He wrestle by the time he gets here. But. <laughs> he's actually good at that, but, um, but that, that's, that's where my concerns are, um, 
and you know, I'm glad that it's a yearly thing that we can take a look at it next, next year. So I'll continue to hear some of the arguments. So I'm not 100% against it, but I just want to make sure that we're preserving Wareham sports um, and you know, the kids that have committed to it. One thing you have to keep in mind is, is that there is a possibility that we will not have enough players to play hockey this year. And that, that's what, when we was talking to Carver, it, the wrestling idea was on the table, and, and I knew wrestling had low, I know they had low numbers in wrestling, and, and, and we, we, Scott and I, at the end of the year, looked at our numbers in hockey and said, oh my God, we are, at a, like if just the kids returning, there are a couple of kids that are not gonna play, they're gonna play at other levels, just the kids that are returning from Wareham right now, we cannot field a team. We can't, we, could, we what, would what not be that, able to put enough what kids What is that the number? Ice. What's that? What is that number? Exactly. That are returning. 12, was it? I, I, I believe it's even less than 12. And, and the 12, including the two kids we're hearing rumors that aren't going to play. So you're looking at, and I think there's, we don't know how many eighth graders are coming in because we don't know what school they're going to. Some may go to Upper Cape, some. So we're not sure on that. that that'd be a guess. But it's low. It's concerningly low. Okay. But I don't see this as a long-term situation. The numbers in 6th uh, and 7th grade combined are over, are over 30. So this is a short-term fix for a bubble that's at the middle school level. It's, I, I wouldn't imagine. And it would keep hockey going in our community, regardless of what, I mean, it would definitely keep hockey going in our community. And then, the, for like, like you would ask, the following year, if, if the numbers are better, they won't approve it anyways. It would be a, it would be a good, it would be a, just a, a stepping stone into, into when, that, when those old seventh, eighth graders, are they sixth, seventh? I know there's good numbers down there. Seven. When those kids come up and play at that point, it would probably be no longer a co-op. But then we would have to figure out how to fund it. What's because that? We, we, would figure out, we would need to figure out how to fund it because we no longer have that co-op where we're earning the $4,000 because we're splitting the program back now, so we would have to find our own coaches. And no, that's just wrestling. The, 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 the funding for hockey is staying in our budget as okay. is. Yeah, okay. so it, there would be no change in the funding at all for hockey. We just we just. I didn't know if back. it was a combined deal nope. where you know no. we'll that's only just do the wrestling end of it. Wrestling, if you do hockey, also. No, that's just okay. the wrestling end of it. Thank you. I was I smart when I. Thank um, to, to Rhonda's point, though, um, applying that to wrestling, would we lose wrestling if they bowed out? If we didn't have Matt and couldn't fund it, yes, yes. And that's just that would just be a reality. I mean. Yeah, but I have a plan that. If I can get a couple of years with the co-op, that Carver's numbers are going to increase enough where they can split and become Carver High School wrestling again, and Wayham will have enough numbers and a mat to be able to split. I have a lot of friends in the in the wrestling community that are, that are that are going to help me fundraise for mats. So, you all set, man? Want me to come uh, back to you? Yeah, I think. Cliff. Yeah, I had a couple a couple of questions I had written down I forgot to ask. Um, the first is, has this been run by the Carver School Committee? I don't think it has, no. Okay. But I'm not positive, but I don't think it has. Um, see, and then the other thing um, I, had in my, I had written down before you talked about the 12 kids. Um, I'm not convinced that we're in a position to afford hockey to begin with. I'm really not. I'm not convinced that 12, I'm not convinced that we were in a position, forget the co-op, forget the, the co that we were in a position to afford hockey anyways. Mm -hmm. I don't know where we're going down the road. I don't know where these overrides are going. I don't know what our budget situation is going to be. I do know what hockey costs. So, um, and then when you tell me there's 12 kids and we can't, we couldn't possibly feel a hockey program, then to well, me that makes my that makes my decision easy. Well, there's 12 and there's whatever comes in as eighth graders. But 12 is my guesstimate. I, I could I could get back to you on the exact number. Again, but. it makes it makes it makes it clarifies it in my own head as to the budget implications of our the total budget implications of our school system. Um, I look at it, you're going to crush 12 kids if you cut this. Well, part. you know what? Crush you're going to crush, we've been crushing a lot more than 12 kids. Yeah. We're crushing a lot more than 12 kids. We can make it work, though. Yeah. But no, we're crushing a lot more than 12 kids. 
We're crushing a lot of kids at the elementary level when you've got oh, 30 in a classroom. I, I get you, <laughs> believe me. Go ahead. Mike, you want me to come back to you? Uh, no, I, I'll, I'll go. Um, That's what I mean. Now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but I started off really excited to hear this, and, and I'm, I've been persuaded a bit by Dr. Sylvia, and, and the, the perception the perception is, is a big deal. I mean, we had, we had the, 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 free, the free kindergarten, which was such a no-brainer, and I, got, I heard so much from that after that meeting, like, how are you doing this? You know, like what the, but the people outside of this room, a lot of them don't understand it and, and how it's such a win-win for everybody. And I guess my question is, when do you need an answer on this? Like, can I wait till after, you know, we, we do the overrides and see where we stand after that? Not, not if I've got a schedule and get, get things in place and things like that, no. I, I mean, I, yeah, but now I'm running into a situation where we're not gonna be able to do some of the things we have to do to get, to get the programs going. We gotta file forms at the MIA, we've gotta get approval for that. That's gotta be done, I, th I think it's technically, is it four months before the start of the season? Those forms have to be filed through District D, so. We're, we're kind of we were kind of crunching the time frame bringing it this late, so can it wait maybe another meeting or two? Is, is that going to accomplish what we need to accomplish? I'd like to talk to people about it. Yeah, I mean it could, but I I think if you I think if we wait for another you talking another month. At most, I'm pushing it a little bit with time, but I mean, I, I, if 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 that's what's going to happen, it's going to happen. But I'm pushing it, time. It, if it goes to a vote right now, I'd probably abstain. You know, I I, I'm, I'm, I I I like the idea. I was excited, but but Dr. Sylvia has got me thinking. <laughs> Dr. Sylvia's got him thinking. <laughs> um. Are you all set, Mike? Yeah. Rhonda, did you have something else you wanted to say? I think the only question that I have is, do you know when it's going to go to the Carver School Committee? And you'll, because you'll probably need that because you're going to have to file joint, yeah, joint forms, I, correct? I'm guessing, but I don't think that that's a pro. I think the Carver School Committee is going to slam dunk it because Mike, when he proposed it to me, well, when we proposed it together, I said that we were going to meet with the school committee and he said, call me immediately right after if the school committee approves it and I'll get my end taken care of. So he'll have it taken care of. I don't think it's know, as much Monday. of an issue on, on their end for many reasons, <coughs> but mainly they spent a lot of money on that cooperative uh, hockey team uh, because I did meet with Mike when he came into Wayham High School, and uh, they have that money earmarked already, so it's, it's really a no-brainer for him, and he said it will not be an issue with his school committee, and I said, well, it will be an issue of mine. We need to go through the process. I said, we're going to be cutting teachers, and you know, I said it has to be it has to be a positive flow of cash for that one year for them to approve that because they're not going to approve it if it's costing us four thousand dollars. I said if you show that we're bringing in four thousand dollars, we have a chance. And uh, and I think what most likely will happen is that if it's not approved, then we're going to lose out in wrestling and in, in the four thousand dollars and probably have hockey, and they're going to struggle. They're going to struggle with numbers. If if we can field the team, but I mean I I you know. I, I'm not positive. I don't know. It's, it depends on who comes in. Cliff, let me just lay out an opportunity. Let me let me lay out a a scenario, okay? And then I'd like to make a motion. Can I do that? Can I have them answer my scenario first? Well, I had some questions too. Oh, okay. but well, you're going to put discussion. Yes, so I can. Give a second. All right. Okay. Here's the scenario. We vote. We vote to go ahead with this tonight. Um, and Kava votes to go ahead with it. So everybody, everybody's happy, hunky-dory, these 12 kids are, are happy and everybody's happy. The, the budgetary reality hits us in August and we gotta come up with, you know, umpteen dollars, whatever. And one of the strategies that we wanna use is we just can't afford to have hockey anymore. That'll be one of the strategies that we use to dump hockey. Could that be done even though we were a co-op? Couldn't we still do that? I'm not sure. I, I, I can find I mean, out. What would stop us from doing it? It's still I, our I don't hockey think, program. I think you could, yeah, it's but I'm program. not sure. We can do whatever we want. 
So yeah. if, if worse came to worse, we could still dump hockey if we wanted to, even though we're a co-op. I, I would think so, but I'm not positive, yeah. I could make a phone call we're, find we're out. We're in charge of, of hockey. Since it's, charge, our, since it's our, yeah. in charge of wrestling, just like they could do the same to wrestling. Yeah, because okay, we'd be the whole school in hockey, so. Go ahead. And again, that 12 number, I'm going to get back to you exactly with the number. But, it, it, I mean, it's thereabouts. It might be a little higher. It might be a little lower. I don't know. Did you say the hockey budget is approximately 24000 For us, it, I think we spent about 20, 22, but we cut a lot of ice time out. This time. is 24 on the proposal. 24 of a, is a proposal hockey budget to run a high school hockey program. Okay. We ran it with about 22 because we cut all our Sunday ice times out. So in other words, our, our, our athletes skated which, less than most which other number, schools did. Which number is in the FY13 budget? 24. Okay. If we take that 24,000, and let's assume optimistically that you get, I don't know, 14 kids, okay? And, they, and none of them are waivers. Now, that's a crazy assumption because half of our kids are on waivers. So maybe we shouldn't use a crazy assumption. Let's assume that four of our kids are on waivers. So let's just subtract a hundred, a thousand dollars from that. So we're now, um, we're now down to thirteen thousand, uh, twenty-three thousand. Okay, we'll take that twenty-three thousand and we'll divide it by the fourteen kids. Okay. That is $1,642 per participant. You just gave us numbers today for spring sport that averaged about $210 per participant. In other words, ice hockey would cost eight times what the average spring sport is costing. I personally find that in this environment in which we are forced to to operate where we're laying off teachers and all the rest of the things that we know about and I don't need to list I first I frankly find it unconscionable I was under the impression that these two proposals were not in fact linked that we could do the wrestling or we could do the ho hockey or we could do both are you telling me that in fact they are linked? I think they're linked by our design. I think there's an opportunity for them not to be linked, if that's what you're asking. I think it was a, they had a need uh, with, uh, they didn't have a place for their kids to play. Um, Mark felt there was a need for a winter sport, uh, and he felt wrestling was a good venue, so we somewhat had a need, and so that's, that's I think, how the conversation began. That's exactly how it But it's not, they're not married, if that's what you're asking. Good, because this committee member thinks that the citizens of this town expect shared sacrifice, and we're asking them to sacrifice with these overrides and debt exclusions, and they want, part of the sh shared sacrifice, for example, is they say, well, if we, if we come up with these extra monies for taxes, then maybe we ought to have some fees for bus drivers, not bus drivers, for, for getting kids to school. Any number of sacrifices are possible. So for us to add a program and keep another program going that is costing eight times the average for our spring sports, I can't frankly sit here and defend. On the other hand, I think if we went to them and said, we had a great sport, but we, in this environment, we couldn't justify keeping it, but we came up with another sport so, so that kids had a great sport to uh, play in the wintertime, and not only did we come up with that, we came up with it in a way that was better than cost neutral, they would say, that's really creative, out of the box thinking, and I applaud you for it. So this committee member thinks your wrestling idea is a great one, and I admire the fact that you came up with it, but this committee member couldn't possibly support $1,600 per participant for, for a hockey program. Just couldn't do it. Even if there's 20 hockey players, 
the way you're the way you are dividing the cost per kid. Even if there's 30 kids, it's not doesn't make sense. If I can right? just make two comments, um, I'm, I'm not saying that negatively. Like like it's an expensive sport. Philosophically. I don't think a kid should be penalized because this sport is expensive. But uh, being the man that handed out six pink slips, I, I, I know I understand what we're talking about here. I know I get it too. You, I you, hate the you idea know, of dropping. You know, in girls' in tennis, we don't I, allow the use of the word fair because they all recognize life isn't fair. Okay. I, I, I mean, I get what you're saying. I, but, I, but just the the other so, piece. It's not what I thought. <laughs> the the other piece, if I can is uh, I was told by one of the candidates that applied for the coaching job that we recently had for hockey that 12 kids from the middle school are uh, going to be playing next year. But out of the 12, nine of them have applied for uh, top of Cape. And, so that gives us you know, again, as I, as I mentioned before, I'm in a position where there's no other school in the district that has a competition that I have to try and keep kids in the building. I, again, I, I prefaced earlier, I don't think a kid should be penalized for hockey, but I think if we can... And, and again, maybe in August we're sitting here saying we've got to cut so many dollars from the athletic program. Maybe this is a mute point. But I really think that based on the numbers that we've been given through the Gateway Youth Hockey, we are in a, a one to two year lull in hockey. And I totally get cost per pupil for cost per athlete in this case. The number is going to be um, more palatable uh, for the school community members cost per athlete as we move forward. My concern, no matter what it is, whether it's a teaching position or an athletic program, is once you cut it, we all know it's gone. And uh, so there needs to be a balance, and I agree with you know, Dr. Sylvia that we're making cuts, and it's not fun. I don't, unfortunately, with total respect, as you know, I just don't accept your characterization of it being punished. There are kids who would love to play lacrosse. Are we punishing them by not having a lacrosse program? These kids play, though, right now. Like they're, yeah, they're, you're a talking a sophomore I coming back to play. But there are all sorts of things, we, there are all sorts of things we'd like to no, do, could program. do. Changes have to be made, including laying off half a, dozen, half a dozen, seven teachers, et cetera. So I don't want to belabor this point. I'm just saying tough choices have to be made. And I think the community expects them to be made. And if we make them, we're more likely to get support for the things that matter even more, which is getting some teachers back on the payroll. Dr. Rabinovich. I, I believe we have transitioned from a discussion and whether to accept a cooperative athletic team to a discussion of cutting a sports team, which is not on the agenda and I believe is a violation of open meeting law. No, no. I disagree. No. I disagree too. We're not discussing that. We are discussing a cooperative program which was on the which was on the agenda. But did you say yeah. you agreed? I, I do. We're talking about we're we're talking about what came in front of us was a discussion on whether to form a collaborative program with um, with Carver. And it has morphed into whether we need to cut hockey out altogether. No, is what no, it seems it like hasn't. where it was going. So no. uh, I, I disagree. I, but I, I, I do I, think we've absolutely gone. Absolutely disagree. I, I disagree too. Going on and on. Would anybody like to make a motion? I would. Go ahead. Before I make the motion, I'll make one point though. And this is very, very important. <laughs> I'm not a hockey fan. I don't even like hockey. All right. But you know what? We've been committed to hockey all this time. So th this isn't my comments weren't about I want to cut hockey. My comments were that you have to look just like you look at your class size. You can't run a class with three kids in it. Well, you can't run a hockey program with 12 kids in it. Okay, that's all I was saying. And I was saying that once we go into a co-op program, if the numbers still do not justify the hockey program, then we may have to look at cutting. That's all I said. I didn't say I want to cut it. I don't, I don't care. Because we've been committed to hockey all this time. So therefore, because we have been committed to hockey all this time, there is money in, in the 13 budget for hockey right now, okay, that I will move to approve this request as presented. Could you define this request? Carver, uh, to the request to uh, enter into a co-op proposal with Kava for hockey and wrestling. Okay, I have a motion on the table. Do I have a second? Second for discussion. Okay. 
We are now have a motion on the table for discussion. The question that I had is when you had conversations with them about um, taking on the cost of wrestling while we continue to take on the cost of, of um, hockey, was there ever discussion, because maybe Carver's more flush than we are, that they might take on some of the expense of the hockey team as well? It's, it's a win for them, but then it's also a win for us because we're in a tough budget cycle and that would they be willing, I know that it would be an increase in their budget, um, but would they consider taking on a portion of the costs of, of the hockey program? Well, I could certainly propose it, but the thought process was that hockey's already in our budget for next year and wrestling's already in their budget for next year. So we try to be creative to try to find ways to add wrestling. Hockey's already there and, and, and it was our thought. And, so we tried to find ways to be created to add wrestling or another program into Wareham and funding with it. Right. So but if the Carver School Committee read any Wareham papers and they would also and us reading theirs and they would understand Carver doesn't have the same kind of financial um, concerns that we do and so they'll be cutting because of participation. We are looking at cuts across the board because of the amount that we have to cut out of our budget this year. And so that's the only reason why to ask the question, mm -hmm. um, because again, they're not cutting because of budget. Did you have a number in mind that you'd be looking for? Half. For Just them to come up with twelve thousand. Right. Never happened, I bet. Okay. No, hey, I'm, I, I, I'm I always could, on negotiation side, so I'll always go high. So if you want to come back and say, I just, I just think that they, they, they lost their co-op with, with Sacred Heart. I would just think that they would say it's not. And Sacred Heart budget, picked so. up the total cost of the hockey program for them? I don't know how it worked. So it the was, thing is, that a, is there money there? It was a per, that per athlete. Fee. I could certainly look into it. Right. If they did have a budget for hockey and that money is still on the table there and still budgeted, then it doesn't... I think if you gave us, uh, and I, again, however this works, if you gave Mark a proposal that it would be accepted if Carver came through with this amount of money, I think if, if the athletic director who again I met with, had the confidence that it would be approved if Kava came up with this amount of money. And I don't know procedurally if that's even okay, yeah. but, but they, I, if they had that approval pending $12,000, I think they can make it, I know they can make it happen. And I, well, and I'm, so if that's something that, you, that we can do procedurally. Um, and, that, and Mr. Chair, that wasn't my motion though. My motion that. was just to accept this as it was presented. Okay, now we're getting into negotiations, we're getting into how much money, we're, wait, we're getting into let's make a deal. That's not what we're here for. We're yeah. here to say, we're going to do this or not do this. If the vote's no, then it's not, we're not doing it. If the vote's yes, then we are doing it. And then it's going to be up to our administrators to work out the best deal. And I, I, will, I will certainly go and address, I mean, I'll, I'll call them tomorrow and see if, we can, see if we can find a way to buffer some of the hockey costs. So get get... You're right, there might be some money that they've put aside because they were co-oping with Sacred Heart, right? With right. Sacred Heart, that maybe there is some money there that they would. Because from where I sit, we could scrap this at any time. True. Mr. Chair? Yes. Speaking to previous speaker, the only reason why I think that it's an important, I'm not into negotiation, I'm not, but right now we have a proposal in front of us that includes, that includes costs. So mine would be amendment to the, the motion. I don't know the procedure lane. You'll figure that out. But mine would be um, the amendment would actually be estimated cost per sport, hockey 12000 wrestling 11000 whatever. We would, it's not me trying to negotiate. It's basically what I think that I could approve is a lower cost, basically a cost savings um, to go into a co cooperative program. So instead of just making $4,000, we're actually making $16,000 in this because I see it as an opportunity well, for us to be able to, um, to help out our program and to help out our sports and help out our system. So. We have a motion on the table. I did not hear an amendment. Any other discussion? Am I allowed to make an amendment? Are you allowed to make an amendment? Um, yes. Okay. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make an amendment to approve the proposal with the following changes. Estimated cost per sport, hockey 12000 wrestling 11000 Do I have a second? 
I'll second it. Any discussion? Okay, we'll take it. We'll take a vote on the amendment. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. Abstain. You abstain. Okay. So the, the amendment passes 210. Excuse me, 211. 211. It is now the main motion. Any further discussion? Okay. I have a further discussion, if I, if I could. <laughs> no? <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstentions? I abstain. I'll abstain. Two zero two. Two zero two does not is that passes. Parliamentarian, yes, that passes, correct? <laughs> yeah. Two I zero mean, two. I get a vote. Two zero two. So I'm just trying to keep it from typing. I'm yeah, I understand. Mark, did you have a comment you want to make? Yeah, so I, I am going to go back and propose to Carver that we, if we do the two co-op programs, that they have to put $4,000 towards wrestling, well, in a sense, because we're going to keep, instead of splitting users' fees, we'll keep all these fees. So they're going to let us borrow a mat for 10000 which is worth about 10000 and they have to come up with $12,000 to buffer some of the costs for hockey. I think that's an accurate assessment of the motion that just passed. Mm -hmm. You have two weeks to be able to come back if all of a sudden the negotiations don't work out in your favor and come before us with another motion. I'm sure Mark will get this done. <laughs> uh, are we uh, And if done? they say no, that's it? Then we come back. Um, we come back. You'll have to come back. We're not what going to give you What happens if Wareham splits and becomes Non, it doesn't doesn't have the co-op with Carver in two years. You'll be back to us, won't you? That. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Yes. Uh, if 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 it doesn't work out, would we have an opportunity to just vote on the wrestling only? Yes. Yeah. That that's what I was hoping for. Well, I think that I'm sorry. May I speak? Yes. So, Mark and and to my committee member, this is. I think that. From my perspective, I want this to work. I do. But there is an opportunity that maybe we're not taking advantage where they do, they're able to help a little bit more. That's all this is. That doesn't mean that you can't come back after talking with them and come back with the exact same proposal that you have in front of you or something different that we can vote on again. It's just asking for a little bit more of... Um, we're asking for half. I think it's... I think it's an, I think it's a lot to ask, but I do too. Half. We're asking them to pay half of our. That's where I think that that's where all of a sudden that's where the negotiation starts. So you're coming back and you're saying that now instead of 24 and 11, it's you know, but at least we've gotten. We, we can try. It's worth a try. We went into this thing in good faith, and we're not showing good faith right now. Who's we? The board. These people went into this with good faith. And we just pull the rug out from under them. I don't agree. I, I know you don't agree, but that's a fact. I don't think we were a party to it, but let's not dwell on this. Um, thank you very much. You, I appreciate you. it. And Mark, I meant it when I said I appreciate the initiative and the creativity. Thank you. Um, next on the agenda, we have a minor have change to the school calendar. Yes, I'm asking that we amend the uh, school calendar for 2012-2013. The one amendment happens in November um, for Veterans Day. Veterans Day comes on Sunday the 11th. I have found that two of our contracts um, include Veterans Day as a paid holiday. So if we have work on Monday, then I would have to pay the custodians and the secretaries. It would cost us about $15,000. By having a no school that day that day and giving them the day off, um, then we save ourselves $15,000. Also, 
the veterans um, agent came by the office and said that they were planning their activities on the Monday. Now, Veterans Day, we always thought, was the one holiday that you celebrate on the day of the 11th, and that's when we put this together. But the state has recommended things be done on the Monday because of the Sunday holiday, and therefore that's why the veteran agent has gone in that direction. So that's why the reason for the amendment um, to give one additional day off, and we would have one more day in June to go. Okay, I'll take a motion to that effect, and we can discuss it as part of that. So moved. Second. Second. Any discussion or questions? Can we add Easter? <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? Cliff, did you? Aye. Aye. Okay. I just have a point of information. Four zero zero. Yes. For the the school calendar. Dr. Veneris, what is the difference between an early release day and a half day? Early release and a, ha and a half day? Yeah, there's, there's two things on the school calendar. One says an early re release, and then the, the Wednesday or something before Thanksgiving is just a half day. Okay, the, the um, day before Thanksgiving is an early release that does not involve lunch for students. Yeah. And all the other early release days are for professional development and they happen after lunch is served. So the half day is gonna be much earlier than? Th that is correct. In an elementary school, I believe it's like 11, about 11 o'clock. That happened this last year? Yes, it's happened every year. In fact, all of our early Sorry. release days used to be at, without lunch, but we, about two years ago, changed it to serve lunch on every one except for the day before Thanksgiving. And part of that is you have staff that um, travel and um, try to get out of town to family and relatives. Great, thank you. Um, school committee meeting dates. Dr. Rabinovich, do you have that list? Because I didn't get it in my packet. You didn't? I did. I did. Why could I not find it? What was it called? Meeting dates. <laughs> <laughs> How creative. <laughs> so um, hopefully in your package you have a draft that says meeting dates. Um, there are two dates in uh, July, two in August, actually two in every month except for um, February. February. And April because of the two vacations. Right. Has everybody had a chance to look at it? Christian. I have a question on one of the, is one of the July dates May 18th? No. Good. Go, go on. I'm, I'm, I'm go glad on. this meets with your approval. Yeah. We have three other live programs on that date, so. Okay. Um, so, every month starting in July, twice a month with the exception of February and April. And three in January. Yes, and the usual three in January because of the budget presentations, public hearing, and vote. Mr. Chair, when, yes. would, when would you like to know if a member would not be able to meet, um, be at one of the dates just beforehand? Okay. Before just vacation schedules during the summertime and Obviously, it's great if a, a member can make every one, but it's it's not expected. Every, it's a lot of meetings. Yeah, I just <laughs> want to make sure, like, if there is a certain meeting date that you know that more than three members are not going to be able that, that's what I mean, just to, to make sure that you have a quorum for each one of the dates right. that are listed I, there right now. I have not been informed that anybody's going to miss any dates, so I have no concern about a quorum as I sit here today. Um, Mike? I, well, I, I just got this on, my, on the desk when I showed up. It's from the mask. Right. And it mentions something between November 7th and 10th for you, me and my colleagues. <laughs> Is that something we want to do? I haven't even, I haven't even read it yet. Just the, the date that's rang a bell. That's the annual work meeting. And that, I see that November 7th is on the... But that, those like are all day. during the day, I okay. believe. Okay, during the day. All right, I, I just happened to see it. And I suspect that November 7th is just an evening uh, dinner, keynote dinner, and it probably won't have any of the um, conference 
portion of it on mm -hmm. Wednesday. So I don't think it will actually be a conflict. Um, but that's, of course, up to people to decide if they want to go to that keynote dinner. In other words, you wouldn't miss any of the actual programs. Yeah. You'd just miss a dinner mm. if you decided, um, if we decided to meet on that date. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, didn't we, a few meetings ago, and I'm going to regret saying this, but bringing it up, but didn't we agree to do three meetings a month? No. Oh, good. <laughs> we definitely did not. Oh, no. Oh, okay. I, th I thought we did. <laughs> Priceless clip. <laughs> and uh, yours truly wouldn't expect to have my throat intact if we had. Um, any other questions? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve these. Now, before I, it just occurred to me, you had a conflict. Yes, but it's, um, I was going to do it under new, but it, it's June 20th. Oh, it's which June. Is before so, this, let's, right. so we can vote on this. Yeah. Yes, fine. Um, Good. Yes. I, I can't speak for the summer. I mean, if I'm here, I'm here. If I'm not, I'm not. I understand. So. I understand. Okay. I'll take a motion to approve these dates as printed. I'll make a motion. Okay. Can I have a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Four zero zero. Now, Dr. Rabinovich. Under any other Under business? Under any other business, yes. Um, I have uh, found that I have a conflict for June 20th. Um, it is a family commitment. My uh, daughter is renewing her vows, and for whatever reason, the third Wednesday didn't ring loudly to me that it was a school committee mem meeting. So I cannot attend. Um, and so what I'm asking is if we can move the meeting of June 20th to June 27th. It's fine with the chairman. Any, I'll take a motion to that effect if it's okay with the rest of the members. Wait a minute. That's yeah, okay. So moved. Second. A second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstain? Four zero zero. Thank you for the family piece. Uh, <laughs> just to. Point of information. Yes. When is that curriculum meeting? Oh, the twelfth. Uh, the twelfth at four forty-five. I will not be able to be there. Then I will be happy to take your place if that's all right. That's fine. Unless okay. you want us to look you, to change. No, your I didn't know anything about it anyway, so it's okay. I didn't I'm either. Sorry. But I, that's. Do you want to? You want to try and work it out to move it? Or? No, no. I just won't be there. You know, we also have. Um, um, policy review that yes. evening at 5 30 so that I try to that's on my calendar yeah all right so it's the time that's the Correct. problem okay you sure you don't want to try and reschedule nope. it okay um, the only other thing I'd like to draw people's attention to is um, the mask mask joint conference November 7th through 10th as usual is going to be at the <coughs> resort conference center in Hyannis the dates are November 7th through 10th as Mike pointed out if we register before July 15th, we, we get a discount. So if you could let Michelle know uh, before July 15th, if you're going to be able to make that meeting, that would be beneficial financially to the district. And that's what date? Uh, November 7th through 10th. That's the regular conference. The regular yeah. conference, regular place, etc. Michelle, you can put me down as a participant. Me too. Um, and as Me I, too. I believe the only and and just the two lunches and skip the dinners. Would you like me to fill this out and give it to you? Would that be better? Yes, Fine. Please. Okay. Yes, let's do that as a courtesy to Michelle. Mm -hmm. Is there any other business that we'd like to uh, that we need to talk about? I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. 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 We're adjourned. <laughs> Well, the first school improvement plan.